Good morning. Good morning. It's Monday. It's day 11. 11. It's day 11 of the Alec Murdoch double homicide trial. I can't believe it's day 11 either. Look, I don't even know. I don't even know how we got here, but we did. We're on day 11. This morning, the jury is not going to be back until 1130 Eastern, which means we get the hearings that we love so much that have all the actual information in them, right? I feel like those hearings have been much more clear. I mean, we know the prosecution can't find a non-leading question. We've learned that from these hearings, but we've also learned quite a lot of information. So what we're going to hear this morning, I think, is about this confidential, I say that in paren because it's not really confidential, this secret conversation that Alec Murdoch was having in the presence of Jim Griffin, his defense attorney, but also in the presence of others. And of course, if there are third parties there, it's not attorney-client privilege. It's a privileged conversation if it's between the attorney and the client. But if like your mom and them is there, then that's not an attorney-client privilege conversation if the attorney and the client are also there. And from what we've heard in the days and hours following this murder at Moselle is that literally everyone was there. We heard the police officer say they didn't want to displace the 20 to 25 people so they didn't serve a search warrant. That's never going to happen in your life or mine. That happens for Alec Murdoch. The jury did hear that. They haven't heard a lot of this that we've heard. So are we going to end up at the end of all of these 404 hearings outside the presence of the jury with this information being repeated and also, we're supposed to be a three-week trial. That's Friday. That's not, there's no way that's happening. There's no way this, this jury starts deliberating on Friday. And if there is, I don't know. I, I, we're going we're gonna to read Linda live. Linda will get read live, not members only, to everyone. Because I just can't believe that this trial is going to be done. I've got some hot water and lemon. I got a lot of questions. I want to know this conversation. Look, at this point, the prosecution has has had these nuggets of their case, but it's been presented along with a slug of foundational information and a bunch of other stuff. And so following their story has been difficult. Following their timeline has been difficult. They are making us work for it. The problem is a jury doesn't have notebooks and doesn't have the internet and isn't on Reddit and Twitter to like collaborate and pull this together. They have to wait till the end to talk about this case. And I think that that at this point, is hurting the prosecution because they have not been super clear and easy to follow. We will see where that goes from here today. Let's roll the intro. If you're new here, let us know what you're drinking this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you're coming in from. And we're going to go. We've got, we've got a long day ahead of us. We've got a long week ahead of us. And I've got to get on a flight later this week. So you know what that means. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the Internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. All right, y'all, this is absolutely my I have questions mug i love this mug it's from the law nerd shop if you are interested i just um owned by three bullies they said at the beginning of this trial three weeks total that was the estimate the lawyers gave they estimate time as well as i do and i can't shame them for it because i estimate time terribly um, could people emailing the prosecution ways to help cause an issue don't email any of the parties involved in this case They've got an entire ass trial team. We we have a perception from the outside. We've got to trust that they've got it handled. But no, the prosecution isn't going to read any of them and might investigate who's sending them. So, uh, no, I, I think emailing would not be helpful. Any Contacting any of the parties involved in this case, if you are not a direct witness, is not a good idea. It's just not a good idea. Um, if they, look, if the attorneys want the opinion of the internet, it's not hard to find at all. They can, there are multiple subreddits dedicated to this case. There are podcasts dedicated to this case. There are channels like this talking about this case. If they want that information, they can find it. They can have a, a law clerk find it. There's plenty of ways for them to glean the information from the internet. No one needs to go tell them. They will figure it out if they want to. I don't know if they want to. This might be the way that they do it. Um, where do you get all your sweatshirts with thumb holes? Mostly Target. 
Target knows what it's like to have short arms. Target is like, we're going to be there for you. Also, it I just, when I'm having hot drinks, I don't like it when my hands are hot, but I like my drink to be hot. It's all, so we just, it works. I love thumb holes. I love a thumb hole. Um, iced, co- iced mocha in Massachusetts. Good morning. Good morning. The, um, the court is not back yet. So we're just going to chat for a minute and answer some questions. It is wild. I love seeing how many of you are in here from the UK and from all over the world. I saw a lot of you sending prayers to Turkey. I saw that this morning. Um, no, I saw that last night um, after I went to bed or not after I went to bed, before I went to bed as I was getting ready for bed. It's just wild. And as someone who's lived in Southern California um, most of my life, the second you say earthquake, my like stomach drops. There's something when you have a visceral memory of the thing um, that just that just makes it, it just makes it different. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure my screen is shared so when court does come back, it's not back yet. This is why my my on timeliness to this trial has been, mm, I love this judge. I get a sense that this judge is not the judge that's gonna yell at you if you're three minutes late um, to court because he hasn't <laughs> this entire time yelled at anyone for being late and I'm here for it. So I'm gonna answer some questions and give you kind of my thoughts. It's wild. Uh, it is criminal that jurors do not have notebooks. It's wild that jurors don't have notebooks. That's a decision jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Here's what I will say. This doesn't seem to be a strange decision. This doesn't seem to be outside the realm of what's normal for South Carolina. So the attorneys know this. And if the attorneys know this, then they need to work around it. And if the attorneys know this and work around it, my way of working around things would be having charts and graphs and demonstratives and summary charts that make it really easy because they could take all of those cell phone records and do a summary chart for each witness. So the jury has the summary chart and then all the underlying records to look at. So, so it's easy for them. So it's easy for them. Cheers to our mug twinsies this morning. It's just so wild. It's just so wild. So I don't know. I, I think they needed to, they needed to work knowing that. How long do I think the trial will go for? Well, the defense has a number of experts. I think the defense might take at least a week. I don't, I mean, maybe less than a week. I don't know how long the prosecution has left and it's going to depend if the witnesses we've seen that have taken at least a day come in. I mean, if the prosecution's almost done with their case in chief and they're almost done with their witnesses except these 404 witnesses, we could get into the beginning of the defense's case this week. And if we do that, then maybe maybe into the middle of next week. I don't think closings will be that long. We saw that openings weren't that long. Closings should probably be under two hours for both sides. So we'll just we'll just have to see. Um, we'll just have to see what's going on. But I'm hoping the court will ask them for an update. Don't know what's going on in court yet. I am bummed that we don't get to see, like in Depp v. Heard, we just got kind of an overview of the courtroom and you could see the attorneys milling around. You couldn't always hear them, but you could see the attorneys milling around and kind of see what was going on in the courtroom. This trial, there's just none of it. You're just getting none of it. It's just like clock, seal, chandelier. Ah, as I say that, as I say it, you know, Emily, your lips to the court. Please be seated. Court's back in session. All, all the folks are there. This court's looking more and more full day by day. Good morning. Morning, Your Honor. You ready to proceed? Yes. Right, you see. The streamers are ready, uh, Your Honor. I believe we're uh, again here um, in camera matters, and the state would call uh, Mark Tinsley to the stand. Mark Tinsley. All right. Let's let's see what we have. Day 11. Raise your right hand left hand on the bottom. You're from the testimony about to the court in this trial shall be with you. So is help it, you God. Is it with a C or with a K, K Mark? Saying, state your name again for the record. Spell your last name. Good morning, y'all. My name is Mark Tinsley. You didn't spell it, sir. Sir? Mr. Tinsley, how you doing today? Good. Uh, 
Very quickly, you understand, obviously you're a lawyer, you understand we're here for some uh, in-camera proceedings, so we're not going to go into every bit of background and detail that we would where you testifying before the jury. Do you understand that? I do. I do want to, though, kind of move through quickly some of the subject matter that the state uh, proposes to, uh, to put before the jury. Uh, but very quickly, if you would, just quickly tell us what you do for a living and what, what kind of practice well, you've you already have. told uh, us. Uh, my Brayton. name is Mark Tinsley. I lawyer. practice law in Allendale. I have a fairly uh, statewide practice, primarily personal injury um, plaintiff's work. So just like Alec Murdoch, just like Tom right. Girardi, and, plaintiff's uh, attorneys. <clears throat> How long have you been practicing in Allendale? Since 2000, so 22, 23 years. Do you have a statewide practice, or is it primarily? To the extent I want it statewide. I mean, I, I handle cases uh, statewide if, if I'm inclined to handle those. Their okay. audio peaks uh, so badly. Primarily focused in the 14th Circuit, is that fair? 14th and the 1st. And the 1st. The 14th you know the Circuit is where Murdoch and was you get to know a solicitor. Um, he's in, he practiced law in the adjoining county. Uh, I had a number of cases with his firm, uh, small bars in the two counties, and known him since shortly after I came down there. Small and bars. And do you know other lawyers in the what used to be known as PMPD firm? All of them. And are those uh, individuals that you may have had cases with or just generally in the same line of work with over the years? Yes. Um, I want to take you to uh, February 19, and are you familiar with the uh, boat case? Unfortunately. Okay. And do you represent uh, the Beach family uh, in the lawsuit related to the death of Ms. Mallory Beach? I do. He's the and lawyer ultimately, for Mallory uh, Beach. You ended up uh, accepting that representation and filing suit against a number of defendants, including uh, the criminal defendant here, Alec Murdoch. Is that I correct? did. Okay. Tell the court just very quickly who the defendants that you sued, at least initially, at, at when this case started. Uh, Mr. Waters, I, my recollection is is that I sued uh, Alec Murdoch. Uh, I, th I know I sued Luther's, uh, which is a bar downtown in Beaufort. The liquor store. I sued the Woods which was where the kids had gone for an oyster roast. I sued the Murdoch Family Trust, uh, which owned the property where the boat was launched from, and we believed that there could have been some drinking that went on there. Um, I'm not 100% certain in the first lawsuit if I sued Buster Murdoch, which is uh, Alex's son, um, but I, I think those were the defendants initially. This is outside the presence. And maybe, maybe Randolph Murdoch outside the presence of the jury um oh we didn't sue everyone yet he added after you uh, more. started the boat case and and uh, he sued more people let me ask you this uh did your client renee beach have any particular experience at the scene that informed how you were he very quickly added case? people to this lawsuit and this was a number of years ago so i once you've she added she certainly more people, had an experience that prompted uh, once you've added more people i get that it's now, can you explain that to the court, please? She um, that it's hard to remember who you to initially go sued. Down to uh, the bridge where the boat crash had occurred. I don't believe. I think this was either Monday or Tuesday. So the the crash happens early Sunday morning. I'm going to switch feeds real um, quick because I scenes cordoned off. Literally can't. And, uh, um, this is about going down to the scene. We're going to just switch until the, the car and they're waved under the tape and they go down to the bridge and. And she, she was very upset by that. This is Mallory Beach's family not being allowed and, uh, at the scene, but she, Alec um, Murdoch's family being allowed at the scene. In your discussions with her, did she give you any particular instructions about uh, proceeding forward in this particular case as part and based on that experience? No, no. Um, nobody really gives me instructions. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> The, That's uh, not quite not how long that after works. You get involved in this case, uh, did you have any uh, um, chance to review and look at any insurance coverages that may be available to the defendant? Sure. Um, my recollection is within a week, certainly a uh, two week kind of time frame after the boat crash, Danny Henderson, who uh, was handling the boat crash as Alex's personal lawyer, I imagine brought me all of. The Alex Beach family has waived so I reviewed him at that time, whatever privileges appropriate well, what to allow him to testify. Um, the Beach family 
you know, I believe in a civil case, the only thing that we assisted. can do to try to, under the law, make a I'll party answer questions whole about is the recover money I can. damages. And oftentimes, when we are um, drafting lawsuits, we will try to draft the initial lawsuit to make sure that there's insurance coverage. So, so that was the reason I wanted the. the I will switch back to the other and, fee with and closed captioning. Beyond that, soon. sometimes, uh, like I did with some of the initial defendants, you can because of the circumstances, because of the culpability, how bad the liability is, how catastrophic the loss is. Many times insurance companies can be leveraged to pay their insurance out, to get, the, get these people closure. No amount of money is gonna make them whole. Um, so the best that we can do is try to get them some closure and help them heal. All right, and what did you- and That's about all you can do. What coverage is uh, were available to Alec that potentially could be relevant to the boat crash. Eric Land well, is so on the there was five hundred thousand dollars that Progressive dollars. had on the boat. It was a watercraft policy, although I've never seen the policy. That insurance was offered uh, almost immediately uh, to all of the victims, um, not just the Beach family. There were two other girls on the boat uh, and two other boys, and in, including Paul Murdoch, um, and so. When I reviewed the policies, it was apparent to me that there was no possibility that any of the insurance that he had at the time of the boat crash would apply uh, to this. And if there was a possibility, it would be limited to an idea that uh, Ellick was negligent in allowing Buster to drive the boat to give Paul his duplicate ID that he had made so Paul could purchase alcohol. Did uh, Alec have a policy, Paul was under policy age. with Nautilus at this point in time that was available? He, he, he did not. He Buster had, uh, had a duplicate driver's license made it, it, that Paul used to buy It appeared alcohol. from review of the records that um, there was an open claim when the policy came up for renewal, and that open claim was a Satterfield matter, um, and that it was Nautilus and I think Lloyd's of London, and they would not These renew These are insurance policy. policies. And I'm so he back. had to then so seek other coverage. Back. And what he ended up uh, was with Phil. This is insurance policies. I uh, was with Philadelphia, price. and and it was a commercial hunting operation policy that contained uh, very broad watercraft exclusion. So they even uh, barred a negligent entrustment claim uh, as it related too. to watercraft. And that Philadelphia Buster policy depended on Moselle being considered as a commercial hunting lodge. Is that correct? Not only Moselle, but but the occurrence, in other words, whatever it is that causes there to be coverage had to arise out of a commercial operation, as I read the policy. This is too deep in the weeds for the jury. Um, <clears throat> I think. Realizing but he that needs to as get to the to point, LA, um, and that's what they're trying to do. Specifically, there was was he essentially underinsured as it related to what the recovery you were seeking? That's was leading. Oh, absolutely. Right. And what was your ultimate goal, though, in seeking recover as, recovery as it related to Ellick in this case? Well, my it, it, it changed over time. I mean, initially, um, I believed that the case would settle. Um, I, I didn't see how people could ignore uh, the significance of the loss, the public it support of the community for the Beach family, um, and then the hue and cry as it related to the liability and the Murdochs in particular. Um, and so, you know, it, it changes over time, but, but the one consistency was to get the case resolved. Okay. And uh, did you make it clear to uh, Alex attorneys that this is an uh, you were seeking hearing. We have a, a pin personal comment. recovery that he would have so to the pay as opposed to just accessing what insurance cover We added a pin comment to help. Always. And that was consistent all the way through, is that all, right? All the way through. Were you making substantial demands to the defense that Alex pay a uh, substantial recovery personally? You know, the beach, I, I think the beach by, case by most standards, and I don't want to seem crass when I say this, but the Beach family stood on the causeway for eight days while their daughter's body was in the water. Um, I don't know That's that there's crass. any amount of money that would somebody would willingly take to go through what they've gone through. Um, but, but 
if you were asking a lawyer who does civil work, uh, was I making a substantial demand in terms of a settlement? I think that most people would say yes. In your assessment, did that come as a bit of a, or did the defense express to you surprise uh, that you were seeking a personal recovery from Allied rather than just simply trying to access what insurance company This is all had. very leading, but um, again, we're in outside the presence of the jury. The yeah, defense some, some, some people did. Um, John Tiller was primarily handling the case for Alec, and I didn't get that from John, but, but I got it from a lot of people. Um, in August of 2019, uh, is there a particular conference that those I think Buster uh, wants to know about the boat to? case. Uh, it used to be called the Trial Lawyers Conference. Um, but yeah, it, it's in Hilton Head, and, and I went in 2019 of August. Did you see the defendant there? I did. And did you have a conversation with him about the boat case? I did. All right. Can you relate that conversation to the court, please? Yeah. Um, I think by counsel. Why I'm not 100% certain that it was a fundraiser either for Mr. Harpootlian or it was a fundraiser for Lindsey Graham. Uh, as you come into the hotel, there's a, there's a gathering area. It's in the evening before um, everyone goes to dinner or it's immediately after. I'm not 100% certain. Uh, but the room's full of lawyers, and Alex okay. sees me, and he comes across. And oh, he, he gets wanted to chat up close in my face and says, Hey, Bo, what's this I'm hearing about what you're saying? I thought we were friends. And I replied, Alec, we are friends. Uh, if you don't think I can burn your house down and that I'm, that, that I'm not doing everything, and I'm not going to do everything, you're wrong, you need to settle this case. Okay. We are friends. And so what was the point You're of that conversation? What, in a what friendly was, way. Uh, if you can explain to the court what y'all were talking about, what, what is what is Alec upset to as you understood it? That he was going to have to pay was, was what he was hearing. That's what it was. That's what the, the point of it was. We're friends. I took it as he tried to intimidate me. He didn't intimidate me. Uh, and He's and probably sort taller of than this dude. Into, backing off. Alec is a tall man. I can imagine he would absolutely um, get in your a, face and be uh, like, what is this I hear? Mediation in September Lawyers of 2019? Lawyers use their was, physical no, space 20. to intimidate all the time. September of 20. 20. Uh, before we get there, we move into uh, early March of 2020, and we probably all know the answer to this, but what happened in March of 2020 that kind of changed the world? Yeah, COVID, the court shut down. And did that have an effect on slowing down things in the court systems? It, it, it definitely stopped the court system. Um, we continued to take some uh, depositions, pr primarily law enforcement. It was at the scene um, early on, and then ultimately when everything finally shut down, I'm not sure if it's, if it's May or April, when then you know, we were sort of confined to our offices. Did you, uh, during Buster the course is of COVID, in the courtroom. I take the opportunity to sort of present the case to a mock jury to get an, an idea of how that jury might respond. I did. Right. And were the results I can imagine how a mock for jury your client responded. and not favorable for Alec? They were. Okay. Did you ultimately communicate that fact to the defense? I did. I can imagine and how a mock jury responded. Did you responded. come into possession of some social media videos that uh, you believe would be very uh, mm -hmm. advantageous to proving your case and achieving a large recovery? I did. Oh. Uh, oh. And I shared those with John Tiller. Oh. Well, we're not here to litigate um, the boat case, but damn, I want to know. Let me get something marked real quick. I, I think this is a good point. The chat is asking, why does this prosecutor sound so aggressive? I, this prosecutor hates Alec Murdoch. Like this, you can tell that this prosecutor, Creighton Waters is prosecuting all of the indictments. Alec's behavior is disgusting. Oh, this, he is not backing down from Alec's cold stare in court. He is not backing sure down from Alec, Alec and I think he's pissed. So and he, he does sound that, angry. The boat crash I case did. makes me angry. Right? And what is that? I get it. Uh, it's a screenshot of text messages uh, between myself and Tabor Vox, Tabor, assisting me in the boat crash case. All right. 
Put Are these attorney privilege place? conversations? Well, I, I'm sure the Beach family has waived privilege for this testimony because I'm sure the Beach family is ready for some justice to happen. Um, there will right. never be a... At the top. They damn sure aren't a placeholder or venue defendant, but they were hoping so. And uh, then you respond about not walking, just taking five or eight and not walking away from someone who's judgment proof. Is that correct? That's that's right. Great. And I, I'm sure the court is aware, but just very quickly, what, what are you, what's being said there about Alec not being just a placeholder or venue defendant? Well, um, so there, there are a couple of things going on here. Um, in October of um, 20, I filed a motion to compel. Um, Alec said he was broke. He doesn't have any money. He may be able to cobble together some amount of money, but he's broke. And I didn't oh. believe it. So I filed a motion to compel. And about a week after I filed that motion to compel, uh, Danny Henderson, who, again, was Alex's personal lawyer, came to my partner, uh, said Thank he couldn't believe that, that we were going after Alec personally. Um, it was a line in the sand that I had crossed, a number of things like that. So that's what this conversation is about. Um, and, you know, by... <laughs> By November, this is, I think, November of 2020, um, the Beach family, they want accountability. Yeah, they, fair. They, they want a pound of flesh, and whatever that's going to be, it's only going to be through a jury. Um, fair. Or through a substantial settlement. All right, well, let me back up, and we'll get to the motion to compel in a second. You mentioned that... You had uh, of course told they by did. the defense, essentially, that Alec had no money, correct? He's broke. Right. Did they say he could cobble together a certain amount? I thought he could cobble together a million dollars. A million dollars. And did you believe that that was accurate? It couldn't have been. All right. And why did you not believe that that was accurate? Well, because he's rich AF, fam. When you practice not law. Not a legal uh, answer. Not necessarily with, uh, it, meaning in the same case, but, but when you go to a roster meeting, uh, if there were 50 cases on the roster in Hampton, Alec may have had 50 or 60 of those percent of those cases. And so they're actively being settled. Uh, I know that he's actively making money, and you just can't possibly be broke uh, if you're making money, not the way he was making money. And then beyond that, I'm, I mean, my clients have known Alec uh, and his family forever, and so their perspective is that there's generational wealth as well. Did you, uh, was $1 million going to be enough Facts. money from your client's perspective to settle this case? It, it, it wasn't enough from, from my perspective. Okay. I can explain that if you want. Yes, please. Yeah. So one of the things that I didn't appreciate, that I came to appreciate by this point in time was, is that, it, and it may not make a whole lot of sense, but if I, if I told a lawyer who, do, who does what I do that I'd settled the case, uh, there's a lot of speculation because I've had cases with the firm and members of the firm are my friends uh, that somehow there's a fix on. I think for a long time, Ellick thought there was a fix on, that, that he was He's just a alone. placeholder, a venue defendant. Right. Um, and, and so if I, if I told you I've settled the case, and then the next question would be, what did, you, what did you settle it for? I said, well, I took the insurance company. If you knew what I know uh, and what plaintiff's lawyers know, you'd think, well, there was a fix. The only reason I would take it is because it was a fix. I didn't see a substantial difference between He's have to explain that, more if he that number and a million the jury. dollars. Um, and so I thought that if you told 10 lawyers who were knowledgeable about these kinds of matters, I took a million dollars from Ellick who, from everyone's perspective, has lots of money, is making piles of money, they would think that it was a fix. So, so that it was a before sham, we even get I think to, is what he's getting to what's a fair amount, what, what should you take? You know, I, the analogy I use with my clients is it's kind of like that show Deal or No Deal. You may have the million dollars suitcase or you may have a zero suitcase, and, but it's not until it's a good idea. there's a significant it's enough a offer analogy. that you could do worse um, that you should settle a case, any case. And, and that's, and so at a million dollars, it just wasn't enough. There wasn't any risk to them that would prompt me to recommend them to take it. Um, did you, uh, 
make any sort of formal or informal offer to them that involve the real property as well as any sort of payment plan? When, when I was told that Ellick was broke, I offered him a payment plan. Sometimes when you settle cases, medical malpractice cases, for instance, with the JUA, they will make payments. He's just talking lawyer uh, talk I at this point. I offered to, for him to sign over Moselle and the beach house, open his books to see that he was broke, and, and then work out a payment plan on the balance. So when you say, okay, you say he's broke, I don't believe that. Show me the books to prove that. What was your response from, the, uh, from Alex's defense? Notice the defendant well, is not rocking sort of back and forth today. Uh, to begin with. I mean, ultimately, I got a formal response, which enraged. was an objection that prompted the motion to compel in October of 2020. Let me get this mark real quick. Uh, Dragon, I have covered the Stephen Smith case in my other other content going through all the cases surrounding the Murdoch family. This Stephen Smith's investigation is not going to come into this case, but I have covered it. Two, see if you recognize this document. No rocking because no jury. Also yeah. fair. So th this Alec is looks um, furious. My motion to compel, which attaches um, Alex's responses to the interrogatory. And we know Alec was moving his right. his legal was fees or trying to move them out to his wife's name. He was trying to structure his legal fees that were coming October in. October 16th, 2020. Which is right. consistent with this. Consistent with this. So he was trying to put his fees in Maggie Murdoch's name. I'm sure this attorney was furious when he heard it, but not surprised. And that came in what day last week? Thursday? With the boss ass CFO of PMPED who just isn't playing. There are so many people who are furious All right, without I'm put, Murdoch. Uh, exhibit B to this motion, your motion to compel up on the screen. And I think he thought people bit. were gonna help him and they are not here to help him. And they are here to tell part, the truth. Is this the objection to one of your uh, supplemental interrogatories about what you're talking about, about uh, opening the books? Correct. All right. And if you would, tell me what your interrogatory was asking for. In interrogatories are questions well, that you in, in broad give terms sworn is, answers. It, 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 well, let's just read it real quick. <laughs> all right. Read that. List all checking and or savings lawyer. accounts, including credit union accounts, certificates of deposit, 401k accounts. Lawyers lawyering. Uh, SEP accounts, IRA maintained by you, IRAs maintained by you individually and or jointly with any others or any other accounts over which Ooh. you had If that does not stop flashing, I will switch feeds in a second. In any capacity, regardless of whether or not the account or accounts have been closed from February 2019 to present. Right. And ultimately, what was the uh, Alex Defense's response to that, generally? You don't it, have to read that, but just tell me. It, it was overly broad, unduly burdensome, and irrelevant. Okay. And so ultimately, you filed a motion to compel, is that correct? That's correct. And the idea was, if you say you're broke, show me the books, and, to, and they had refused to with oh, the response to this interrogatory, as well as others, is that correct? Correct. All right. Alec does not seem to be liking this at all, um, at all, at all. Um, I don't think I will be covering, I mean, I'm just covering oh. Murdoch for trial. So if there is another case going to trial, I'm just covering this one. Um, that's a longer answer. My hubs is a judge and he could not believe how much the lawyers were walking around the to courtroom. I can't when, either. Uh, I can't either. Was being Nobody gathered. can. They're rolling. It's wild. Who, let me ask you this: Who were his attorneys in, in the boat case, Alex? Attorneys. So his personal attorney, as I've said, was Danny Henderson, uh, who is also a partner or shareholder with PMPD. Um, Progressive had to hire John Tiller, and John Tiller uh, was a lawyer out of Charleston. He was mainly Progressive involved. Insurance. At one point, there was Amy Bauer, new week, new suits. Yep. working with John Tiller and then Elliot Condon ultimately. I think Amy left in February of 21, and by then I think uh, Elliot Condon had been hired and was assisting John Tiller. Okay. And uh, uh, Mr. Henderson is a partner in PMPED. He was also actively helping Alec or representing Alec in this case. Is he, that correct? He was. 
and he's the one that initially had brought you the insurance coverages for Allied to get you a, a chance to look at them and see what might be available, correct? That's right. I think it goes both ways because the defense is saying this was motive for somebody to hurt Alec, and the prosecution is saying this is this is the missing money. So, um, or this is um, this is as what was this coming motion to, light. to compel gets filed. Uh, what if anything happened with the? Uh, sort of the communications between your side and the defense side as we moved into the months uh, following uh, the filing of that motion to compel. We all already saw the one text. What else is going on as well? Well, there's, there's a lot of grumbling and, and sort of shock that I'm actually going to hold Alec personally responsible. Not so much with me, but like I mentioned, about a week after this, Danny Henderson uh, contacts my partner. There were a number of times when Tabor Vox was contacted. Um, and, and so nobody says anything directly to me in, in terms of that regard, but that's, that's what's going on. It was, it was said to them because they knew it would then be told to me. Shock. Well, we look at the uh, particular Shock that I would hold right Alec Murdoch that you have filed a to personally on. responsible. And what are you trying to get? What, what information are you trying to get with that interrogatory? Shock. Well, you know, the. The way to, again, like, like I, in my example of the deal or no deal, I mean, what I'm trying to do is put pressure. He doesn't want me to have access to his accounts. At the time, I think it's because I, he'll see, I'll see how much money he actually is making and how much he has. Um, and so, you know, that's what I'm trying to do is put pressure on him to, to force him into a settlement. He did, you don't want it disclosed. Here are the keys to the jail. Um, you enter into an agreement and let's go settle the case. In the event, though, he doesn't settle in response to this, what information are you trying to get? Well, it, it, it's certainly not a number. Uh, it's certainly not Ellick's estimation of what his net value is. I wanted the accounts because I knew that the only way that he could be broke is that money had been hidden. And so I, I was going to look for and trace money uh, or begin Shifting. that process of doing that. And explain that to the court when you say that you had knew that if he was quote broke in your estimation money had been hidden and so therefore you were going to look for and trace that information what do you mean by that why did you think money had been hidden well they just there, there wasn't any way he could be broke i mean I, you know I, I know he's actively settling cases uh, some cases big cases some cases small cases but they stack up lots of cases he's handling a lot of cases uh, so there, there's just no possibility that he could be broke um, by anyone's definition. And we've heard from the the CFO <laughs> that he was trying to structure those if legal settlements to go we'll into his wife's in name or um, to go into an annuity. If ultimately you'd been successful in, in uh, getting a list of the defendant's accounts, what would have been your next step? What's the Subpoenas. Of to, those to, accounts? Uh, to those institutions, yes. Um, were you already aware that defendant had an account at the Bank of America? I, I knew that he had a personal account with Bank of America. I knew he had an account with Palmetto State Bank. Oh, was the forged forged going to come up? So I'm, I'm looking for the balance of accounts in terms of institutions yeah, yeah. and where else he had. But you didn't know how many accounts or what those balances were or anything like that? No, I, I had no idea. I had, you know, I knew he had multiple business entities. He had different LLCs. Um, so I imagine there could be any combination of accounts out there and some which would not have even been in his name. Like the Forged Forge account. I will answer questions After, uh, as we get a break. After the motion I'm going to show you uh, what's been marked as States 403 and see if you recognize that document. He was trying to follow the money yes. for his clients. Again, it's a um, deserved it. screenshot of text messages between Tabor Vox and myself. All right. Let me put this up on the screen. Ray, Mallory Beach's family was not allowed to go into the scene. They had blocked the crime scene tape off pretty far back, and Murdoch's right, family was allowed uh, there. The screen, Mallory so Beach's family was not. On, and again, this is in April of 2021, is that correct? It is. 
and tell me what's going on with this conversation right here and how it relates uh, to these issues. Yeah, so in August of 20, I found out I had cancer. And um, by November, I knew how bad it was. And so in January, I went to, uh, I had stage four cancer and I went to Florida from the end of January till April the 15th of my first round of treatment. So I'd, I'd just come back um, shortly before I was diagnosed with cancer. John Tiller was also diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer. And oh. um, there's some degree of urgency between John Tiller and myself I imagine. to finish this case. Um, I imagine while there's I was a lot in Florida, of urgency. Um, I, I think I failed to mention that Greg uh, Parker's convenience store was also a defendant in the first case, but Greg Parker had done a number of things. And so, so before I leave, um, the issue is, is Greg Parker's moved to transfer venue to Beaufort County, uh, which is where I had Somebody done moved the to transfer mock venue. jury. The focus group was in Beaufort County. And, Not Halton. Um, while I'm in Not Florida, Hampton. things have changed in terms of what he's done that have changed my perspective because when I left, I intended to go to Beaufort. By the time I get back, I think I'm staying in Hampton. And, and so this conversation is for the first time I've said that I'm going to leave the case in Hampton. Um, but if I, if I think that Alec has fixed the jury, that he's done anything to affect the, the outcome of the trial, that I'm going to sue Paul and Maggie the next day in Beaufort. Okay. And he did. Was that communicated to the defense? Absolutely. Um, in the course of your investigation of this case, had you taken depositions of some of the officers who were involved in the investigation? We did. And at some point was that oh. uh, some issues arose that this were this uh, is very relevant to, to me uh, um, to the state grand jury. Um, you're which, the one that tells me everything happens there is secret, so you tell me. But uh, which state grand jury? jury? Yes. <laughs> right. You're the one that tells me everything that happens there is secret, because it is. Ultimately, and we'll while talk you about were in fixing Florida in March and April of 2021. Uh, to your understanding, have the state grand jury reached out to you for information that you had uncovered in your investigation are we of just, the investigation into the boat crash? Are we just, is it Correct. okay to just talk about grand jury proceedings now, Creighton? We're just doing that? Okay. I mean, you're the one who headed up all the grand juries. But I, and, and specifically right. the handling of the criminal investigation by law enforcement. And the investigation into the investigation. Correct. The investigation into the cover up. Um, during the investigation. And that has gone to grand jury, the case with the obstruction of justice regarding the investigation of the boat case. This, for those of you that have not followed the Murdoch saga closely, this is all like, what is happening? Because a lot of this is not related to the murder case, but it's the context of the murder case, and that's why it's so confusing. They're all having a conversation that if you're not privy to all the history behind this is so confusing. So there is a long say what's been marked to states four, 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 history five, of rumors four, six, that two, Alec Murdaugh has uh, had sway hearing, with juries those, that is improper outside of the courtroom sway with juries. I do. All right. And tell me what that, what's going on here, please. Um, there were a number of motions pending uh, in the boat crash case. They had been pending for some time. I mentioned one a moment ago, a motion to transfer venue. Uh, there were some motions to amend. Um, and, and so Judge Hall had set those motions to be heard my recollection is May the 10th, 2021. So I'm, I'm back now. I got a couple of weeks to sort of uh, get my wits about what's going on. And the May the 10th does not line up with June 7th. And that's May 11th, 20, uh, 
21? It's, e good? it's either the 10th or the, my recollection is the 10th. I know the emails say something different, but, um, and in, in the week before, I don't know that John Tiller always knew uh, how many chemotherapy treatments he was going to get or how long they were going to last until almost immediately before. So on, on or about May the 7th, uh, John knew that the day of our hearing, uh, his chemotherapy was going to run long and he wouldn't be done. And, and he had asked the judge to continue the motions, including the motion to compel. All right. And looking at, again, we're now looking at um, stakes 405. Uh, what, uh, what was the judge's initial response to Mr. Tiller's uh, request to have that hearing continued based on his chemotherapy? That we were going forward um, as scheduled and that um, it says Mr. Condon, but it meant Ms. Condon uh, would be able to handle it. All right, looking at stakes 406, uh, okay. what happened after that? Yeah, uh, ultimately there's, what a good, happened there's a good question. What happened next? My recollection next? is I sent another Stick email to the judge um, expressing that I, I really didn't have, they were, they were mainly my motions. They were, Parker's had some motions, but uh, that I didn't have a problem with continuing to accommodate Mr. Tiller. And the judge finally set a, a status conference for, um, maybe it was May the 11th. All right. This is outside the presence of the jury to determine what, if any, yes, I said, what, if any, it's appropriate in this context, what, if anything, the jury will hear about this. We don't know what the jury will hear about this, but we will see what the judge rules after all of these hearings. So that's why it's being heard. You said that initially Judge Hall um, did not want to continue the May 2021 hearing saying that there was another lawyer on for Alex side that can handle it, correct? Correct. And then you kind of interceded and said that this this would work and so it was rescheduled. Is that correct? After a status conference. After but the status conference, it was rescheduled at that status conference? It, it was rescheduled to uh, June 10th. June 10th? All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as stage 407 and stage 408. And just quickly tell me if you generally recognize those documents. I do. One, one is an email um, so from this John is the Tiller rescheduling saying that the judge's law clerk right after the murders. Uh, said that the judge would be sending a message re, uh, telling us that the hearing was going to be rescheduled to June 10th. The other is the email from the law clerk. All right, so the hearing that was initially in May that Judge Hall did not want to reschedule um, was rescheduled for June 10th, 2021. Is that correct? That is correct. And ultimately, that would be to hear a number of things, but one of the most significant things would be uh, your request for um, a list of all checking accounts uh, from Malik, all identification of all accounts. Is that correct? It, it, it is correct that that motion was going to be heard. And um, ultimately, when the murders happen, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 408. What happened to that particular hearing that was scheduled that way? Uh, it was continued. All right. And is that what's reflected in this email right here? It, it is. And then Exhibit 407? It is. The defense is going to argue that that would have been continued anyway due to the death of Alex's After father. Happened, but his father passed on June 10th, so maybe not. Was, let me ask you this. You've known Alec and have worked with him for a number of cases, is that correct? I, I had not worked with Alec in a number of cases, but I've known him for a long time. Okay, but you had, you were generally familiar with him as a lawyer, is that right? I was. And what was your assessment of his skills as a plaintiff lawyer? What was he particularly good at? He was particularly good at um, convincing people they should work with him, reading people, making people feel like Tom uh, they were the most important person in the room, and capitalizing on surprise with the defense. 
you have a case with Alec. He hasn't done anything. It's Monday morning of the roster. Maybe you expect it to be continued. And he says, I'm ready for trial. And so he would he leveraged a lot of settlements that way. All right. Was he good at understanding the reading people? The emotional Great, and sympathetic this is aspects of, of plaintiff's work and tort work that can be so crucial. He was a rainmaker. Defining what recoveries can be in these types of cases. He convinced yeah, people I, I think they he wanted was to work with them. good at reading people and, and knowing what made people tick. You've testified that you had made it very clear to the defense throughout this time period that you were seeking a substantial personal recovery from Alec and had been told, well, he's broke, which you then responded, I don't believe that. Show me the books, correct? Correct. And that was what was on the table for June 10th, 2021, correct? Among other things. Among yes. other things. But that's on the table, correct? Correct. Um, after the murders happened, did that have any effect on your assessment of the case against Alec, and particularly as it relates to the sympathies and the emotion of the case, which can be so important to recovery. Uh, I mean, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. Explain that to the court then. Well, uh, initially, um, probably say the first week, there was the shock and horror of what had happened, and 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 nobody really thought about anything other than that. Um, Fair. But pretty quickly, I recognized that um, the case against Alec, if he were a victim of some vigilante, would in fact be over. Would be over. It would be a. And explain just quickly to the court why that's that. That. Well, you know, that is the testimony. When you're asking for a money judgment, that they want in um, front of the jury. People have to be motivated to give you that money judgment. Um, if you represent Attila the Hun uh, versus some sweet old grandmother, nobody's going to give Attila the Hun money. Uh, they would give money to some sweet grandmother. So if if Alec had been victimized by a vigilante, um, nobody would have brought a verdict back against Alec. And, and, and I had other defendants in the case, um, so I would have ended the case against Alec. You would have ended the case against Alec with just? You know, I, 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 I probably, I mean, certainly there was $500,000 in insurance that was offered. Um, I may have tried to see if he could cobble together the million dollars. But whatever the last offer would have been from Alec's side, that would have been the offer that we took. That's, that's facts. That's facts. That's facts. After this happened, if he, if he is victim of a vigilante, the Mallory Beach case, before, millions hanging over his head and the Mallory the Beach case goes away. That was the point jury presentations that they want that in front of the jury. Some of the results from that, that and how they point. were very favorable to your case. Is that correct? The defense and some of Alec's partners, but yes. And that part was the main though, point of all of this. just stated that if Alec had been the victim of some sort of vigilante, uh, Attila the Hun also not on my bigger part. Related to Alec and Paul as well. Is that correct? Certainly. And that's led to what you, your assessment then in the wake of these murders. Is that correct? Correct. Most of those analogies used to pick other um, historically disfavored figures, but I think Attila the Hun has become a safe one to go with, you know, unless you're going to start using cartoon characters and then you have to go with like, you know. At some point, uh, did you receive any call or any communication from the Satterfields about uh, the, any recovery and the Gloria Satterfield death? Uh, at, at, at some point, my recollection is it's early September of 21, uh, uh, Eric Harriet came to my office about, about that. There are a number of articles in the paper or the papers that are talking about this previous wrongful death case and wrongful death settlement, um, and, and he came to my office at that time. All right, and did you uh, send, them, send them to someone? I sent him to Eric Bland. Eric Bland was not on today's bingo card, but there it is. Oh, probably one second. So I just wanted to grab this question real quick. Why would you end the claim for Mallory's family? Highly unethical. 
Maureen, it's not unethical. What he was explaining is that they would have taken the last settlement because they would not have been able to get a jury verdict back against Alec due to sympathy. So it's strategic, um, very strategic, but the, the boat case goes away. The criminal case goes away. If Alec is a victim of a vigilante, the boat case and all of the boat cases go away as to the Murdoch family and they continue against other defendants because you can't get a verdict back. And that's what he was saying. I would have taken the 500K from the insurance company and just let it go because that is that is the thing that is the most beneficial for the client. So this is strategy. That's not unethical. It might feel distasteful, but a lot of civil litigation Good morning, Mr. would Good morning. feel distasteful if you're um, not involved in it. So you testified not unethical. At month, uh, to the state grand jury, basically this, this similar testimony you're giving here today. Is that correct? Ooh, let's open the door to the state grand jury. Uh, I like this the defense testimony attorney. I gave today is included in what I said to the state grand jury. Yes. And I like it this seems defense like the, attorney the best. The gist of this is that um, you were suing Alex Murray. The defense coming and making it clear. You believed was underinsured for, for this incident, and you're going to go after his personal assets, and that was going to put some financial pressure on him. Is that correct? Uh, not probably not exactly. I mean, I'm not going to go with, with Voldemort you, with the words you in used, the future. But, um, I don't think it was financial pressure because I didn't. I was holding him personally accountable. I was insistent that he pay. Uh, I didn't see how a payment plan on a settlement would put any pressure on Alec. It was um, sort of a deal that he couldn't turn down from where I sat. But you were asking for money from Oh, him. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the inquiry here today is about money, his money, his finances, correct? I don't think so, but um, it certainly concerns his money. And well, what do you you're, think it's uh, about? Anticipating you're going to go to trial, is that correct? Yes. You're going to go to trial uh, and get a verdict against Alex Murdoch, correct? That was what you thought. That's where this was going. No, I, I mean, I didn't see how any reasonable person wouldn't settle the case, especially Alec. Um, so I, I expected the case to settle. 90% of cases settle, maybe 99. But if we had to try it, yes, we were going to try it. And if you were unable to offer more money, um, then your expectation on, say, on June 7th, you know, before these murders, your expectation was if he doesn't offer more money, we're going to trial. Any money. Right. It, was, it was no money. It, right. no, no money had been offered. So your expectation Only was Only insurance money had been offered. If you offer me no money in a case that I'm pursuing against you, then, then the response is uh, we are going to trial. The, the and, response and you were is far from trial on June. That's 7, the response. Twenty twenty one. Were you not? No. You, you believe you were close to taking it to trial? I, I there was an urgency because John Taylor knew that he had about a year to live, and and we were going to try that case. Um, my expectation was early fall, late summer. So they were pushing to go to you trial. You expected to try the the, the boat case, and. The summer of 2020, late summer of 2021? Yes. August, September, October, sometime in that time. You felt right. like you were only two or three months away from trial? Sure. Even though we had all these pending motions that him. hadn't even been heard, including what venue to have? I had tried the case two times with a Beaufort jury in, during COVID. He was ready. Um, he had done all I the mock I was ready to go to trial. <laughs> on, on that day, on June 7th, you hadn't even uh, yet asserted a negligent entrustment claim against Alex A. Well, I had with John Tiller. John Tiller knew and had agreed to the amendment. Right. There were a number of things that Alex counsel had agreed to, including knowing that uh, there was substantial like it was rolling. evidence in the case. And but you, at that time, you hadn't even asserted that claim to the court. They're trying to make That's it seem like it wasn't was. rolling, was but it was rolling. With John Tiller. That's the conversation that mattered because John Tiller would be the one who would object to the late presentation of the evidence, the late presentation of an expert, and he had agreed to all those things. But he had objected to the financial discovery you asked for. Well, there was an objection posed, correct? But he, he did object to that. He's like, when Wah. that answer was given in uh, October or September of 20, it was an objection. And 
It's like we were working through the it. The hearing that was that this that motion to compel the financial detail, the testimony is that's just one of many motions that needed to be heard. Is that correct? Correct. There, there are many motions that had piled up and needed to be heard. There were several. There were several. Do you remember what they all were? There was a motion to change venue. Um, there was a motion to compel against Parker's. There was uh, Parker's had one or two motions. Some of the motions got resolved. Um, Parker's is a chain of gas stations where to assert liquor was purchased in the case and with the agreement by that Paul I would with Buster's license uh, to assert your negligent entrustment claim to get in all of the evidence that they knew I had. Um, that was resolved that way. You've had a lot of motions practice in this case with Parker's, haven't you? More so since the murder. Um, but has that motions practice with Parker's been about the murders of Maggie and Paul? Uh, well, I, I mean, it, it's it's about it in the sense that um, that, that it's certainly created uh, a lot of additional issues to deal with, but no, not specifically. There was, there was a lot of motions practice issues? about allegations of leaking of video from mediation, for example. Right. I don't know about a lot, but th there, I had filed a motion um, that I ultimately withdrew. And uh, you believe Leaking that you of what video? Drag Parker's to a trial within two or three months, late summer of, of June 7th, even though we have all these fairly preliminary motions that haven't been heard, change of venue, asking uh, amend pleadings, motions to compel discovery, yeah, maybe you've never tried a civil case. So um, <laughs> when COVID happened and everything was shut down for two months, I got my case together. My case is not dependent on uh, if, if I'm forced to try it, the bank institutions where he has accounts. My case is not dependent on the leaked video. That's a separate matter uh, and, and, and ended up being a separate lawsuit. Um, so the answer is yes. What? I was ready to try my case. And you didn't need, for example, uh, an answer on the motion to compel that was pending against Parker's. You didn't actually need any of that stuff to go to trial against Parker's. Is that what you're saying? The, the, you're talking about the, the percentage of financials, uh, I mean, percentage of sales that alcohol made up in his profits? No, I didn't need that. Well, These two are just going to be back and forth and back and forth. I That's it, funny. But I didn't need it. It's just. He's the defense is trying to prove, and this is cross examination by the defense. The defense is trying to prove that he was not as close to trial as he thinks he is. And he's like, I've already done two mock trials. Like, we wanted this information. He's like, but I was ready to mount up and ride. He was like, we were riding against health issues. We were riding uh, after it COVID. To be my we're ready to go. Motion to compel against Greg Parker's company. Parker's again is the gas station. So it's just funny watching. It's funny watching the attorneys um, and this is the document I've, uh, on the have a little I've have a little bit of a standoff because it's not often that attorneys are cross examining so have, attorneys. It's not just a uh, buried in here is some request for financial information, but you're requesting answers to Request for production three, production request for production eleven, request for production sixteen. Request also, for the defense attorney, kudos to him for not taking the bait. Uh, he just kept rolling. Request for production eighteen. He's not going to let anyone see he's bothered. Nineteen. Request for production twenty. Request for production twenty-two. <laughs> and request, I like uh, interrogatory number five, interrogatory number eight, interrogatory number nine, interrogatory number ten, interrogatory number twelve, interrogatory number thirteen. I like this defense attorney being unbothered 15, about it. It's kind of funny. Interrogatory number eighteen. It, it seems like it's quite a bit of discovery you're demanding from Parker's in this motion, which I would have had the answer to on June tenth. So e either I was getting it or I wasn't getting it, but it, but it, my. It's like June tenth. We would have known. Wasn't dependent on these things. They may have helped my case. They may have put pressure on uh, Parker's camp, like I was trying to put pressure on Ellick. But um, it wasn't the trial wasn't dependent on these things. And uh, t turning to the motion to compel um, Alex, uh, first, do you believe that the uh, the Judge Hall's um, initial request in May to go forward with pending motion hearings? Um, 
was telegraphing a ruling on that specific motion, or do you believe that that was uh, him looking at these motions piling up and wanting to get some movement? Yeah, I Jared think so. wanted to get shit done. I, 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 no, I, I, there's nobody in the courtroom, maybe uh, even including me, who wants the case resolved more than Judge Hall. And uh, when, uh, when the late Mr. Tiller asked um, for a, a continuance, uh, you don't believe that was any kind of stalling tactic, do you? No. That, that, that was a legitimate health-based concern. And if you read my emails, you would see that, that I immediately agreed to it. John Tiller was my friend. Um, he is not having with, any of this cross-examination right from, now uh, at all. Let's maybe pull that up. He is not having any of it at all. So just for those of you that have just come in, we're almost at 30,000 people here. This is outside the presence of the jury, which is why we can see the sketch artist in the jury box, the photographer sitting over there, but no jury present. These are to determine how much of this information will come in for the jury, if at all. So this is... Shown to you, but I'll show you this is the attorney that was representing the family of Mallory Beach, and this is talking about what was happening, running up to, running up to. So this is asking the hearing for on June uh, 10th. an order compelling production on um, interrogatories nine and ten, and then a set of supplemental uh, interrogatories and supplemental requests for production. Is that correct? It is. And if we turn pumpkin, it's to all the per my last email energy. This is the thing um, I hated about civil and nine stuff. And 9 and 10 are important as well. We didn't cover that, but I'm happy to speak to 9 and 10 because, you know, 9 and 10 asked Alec about. So, sir, no, no one's asked you about it. Okay. <laughs> There's no question first, pending, let's turn sir. To, um, answers this to is, the first supplemental interrogatories. This is the first page of Exhibit B. This is what civil feels like most of the time for me. It's a lot of, like, so you suck back and forth being asked for. Keep of attorneys. Jousting no with D one another. Mine, I'm sorry. B. Oh, B. B. It's it's the first page of uh, what's Exhibit B in here. Uh, it's right there. That's it. Lots of jousting. It's the first page after the motion, so it'd be page nine of the PDF. They're not so. Numbered, Mr. I'm Waters asked you about this list of all checking savings accounts, retirement accounts. Um, Stu and then you, you don't have to, to highlight your It's very your feisty stuff. for the morning. All stock and then number two, all stock certificates, and we go to the next page. All property interest of property of every kind whatsoever um, from February 24, 2019 forward. All life insurance policies, uh, four or five, all personal financial statements submitted to any bank, et cetera. Profit sharing plans, pension plans, et cetera. This is doesn't this look like supplemental discovery after you get a judgment? Supplemental proceedings? Uh, I, I've never had been involved in supplemental proceedings, so no, I don't think so. This is what my people needed answers to before they would agree to take anything that Ellen would have offered. In, in tort cases against individuals, you know, in this case a, a negligence in entrusting a, a boat and a, an alcohol-related you know, incident, <coughs> Before there's even motions for summary judgment, before there's any consideration of, of whether a case has been made for punitive damages, do you typically get this level of financial discovery of defendants? That's a good question. I think so. I think the judge ultimately agreed to give it to him. It's a very good question. He agreed to give it to you. Sure. But I thought the hearing didn't happen. Well, you thought wrong. There's a lot of papers, so maybe you got confused. <laughs> he granted this motion? I think so. You want to see the order? Uh, yeah. I'm dead. I'm just dying. Uh, We're having a whole separate October evidentiary 7, hearing. I am so, I am deceased. I cannot. Oh my God. To, and um, <laughs> the, if I'm wrong, what you've highlighted here is that um, the Mr. T will tell frustration Mr. Tiller, between control, these parties. Unable to gather, uh, provide the same information, answer requests and interrogatories. Once the information is made available to Attorney Tiller, the court will schedule a hearing. If necessary, you forgot the last part. If necessary, the yes. court will schedule a hearing That's if right. necessary. 
which means if Mr. Tiller, the attorney on the case, can from his own client get the information. This is no way says that the court granted this motion, does it, sir? Another oh, just now, arguing. You, I think. I mean, it's clear that John said that Ellick was unavailable because he was in rehab at the time. He couldn't get the material. Um, he's oh. going to get the material, and the judge ordered you get the material. Oh. And if we need to schedule a hearing because you don't have the answers that you want, Mr. Tinsley, then we'll reschedule the hearing. Oh. I mean, this is an order that says the court will schedule a hearing on this motion to compel if necessary. It's My not only granting the motion to compel, sir, is it? Oh, I think so. I think if he was just going to deny it, as you suggest, then it would have just said denied. Or it's, if it was it's granted, premature. Would you say granted? It's fair. I think that's what it says. It's a practical matter when parties have discovery motions, uh, oftentimes, like Ellick is in his own statement said he was working on getting the answers. The reason is you give the answers because you don't want to face what could happen in the argument with the judge. So, so again, this, this, he's working on getting the my answers. My point is, is that if the judge were going to say the judge it's didn't deny it, you're not going to get it. It's denied. Any of the things you suggested in your motion, uh, he would have said that. That's not what he did. That's not what happened. This is why Alex compiling the information because the judge wanted the information. He's not going to back down at all. This defense attorney is asking very good questions. I'm here. I really like this defense attorney's demeanor. He has handled the SAS with great demeanor. He has kept his cool. Of the defense team, this is the attorney I like the best. But Tinsley is pissed. And you can see that you he's pissed. You asked for financial information uh, in the motion that was pending against of Parker. Of course he that was is. also going to be heard on June 10th. That, uh, it, it was different and for different reasons. You asked for alcohol sales, correct? Mm -hmm. What I explained to Judge Hall was, is that they say he's broke. The court's not going to let them litigate so all of my, this. No, sir, no, 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 sir, I'm asking what you asked for from Parker's. I'm pretty sure that wasn't, they that say That would be he's controlling broke. a witness on what the cross. What were you asking for from Parker's? I asked for, among other things, the percent of uh, alcohol sales that made up his net profit, I believe. And this was like the dram shop action against Parker's, correct? They sold the alcohol. Like oh, my God, Brittany, yes. Okay. It's giving reunion energy. And did you get a ruling on that? That, that request for that financial information from Parker's that was going to be heard on that June 10th They just, along with all these other motions that had piled up in a case that apparently wasn't moving very well, quickly. I, I, I understand you don't want to acknowledge what I've handed you. But, um, Sir, I asked you what the ruling was on the motion uh, well, it, from Parker's. It was very limited, and as it related to the percent of sales Woo! of alcohol that made up his profit, uh, it was premature. The judge ruled, unlike he did in that order I handed you, that it was premature at the time. Why was it premature? Well, Sir, maybe you're familiar with premature. The Let me explain Parker's it to you. The difference between Parker's and Ellick is, is that Ellick had, and his lawyers had, 25 videos of alcohol. They had the punitive damages evidence. You didn't see that with Parker's. It was just a straight up transaction in sale. So to the extent you're suggesting that there wasn't this evidence, there were these mere allegations of negligent parenting, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the you argument. You presented that evidence to the court? I didn't have to present it to the court. That's what you don't understand. Let them John just fight. Tiller knew about it. John Tiller is the one who's responding because John Tiller knows ultimately he's going to be in front so of the you're judge. Saying the court well, granting your motion, though, obviously it was saying there might be a hearing on the motion, and maybe at that hearing you would present some evidence in support. But I don't think that's what it says. I mean, sir, you y'all are going to have to agree to disagree. Parker's, it was deemed premature. The Parker stuff isn't damages, coming in. Correct. It, it, it was different than the motion that was related to Ellick. Because the law is. How much money you have is a factor for punitive damages, correct? Well, you, you're, you're making statements of law. I'm telling you what was happening, and what was happening was is that Ellick's lawyers knew what the evidence was. They knew what the amendment was going to be and the allegations, and he knew ultimately he was going to be back in front of Judge Hall making some ridiculous argument that I appears you're suggesting now. And again, Woo! The gist of this is that there was 
The judge is like, bring the tea at this point. He's like, some of this is not coming in in front of the jury. Right? That was going to be the verdict. The jury's not back for another hour. That was going to be judgment day, not this motion hearing where there's a pile of motions that have piled up. And so we saw the one that asked for financial information was deemed premature. Not, not at all. You know what was going on is, as, as I've said a number of times, Danny Henderson was very involved. Danny Henderson was a shareholder. Before I would have gotten the bank account information, before I would have seen the records, Danny Henderson would have seen those records. And I've seen the records. I've seen all the bank statements now. It would have been apparent to Danny Henderson, and I believe it would have been apparent to me uh, what Alec had been doing. So that's the judgment day, is the discovery. And there were a lot of threads that were being pulled, uh, and it was the subject day. to unraveling at any moment. And if those records were disclosed, if Danny Henderson reviewed those records, Woo! he would have known there's no way Alex getting these checks, there's no way these checks are going to forge, there's no way that this money should be transferred. And the even threads if, are unraveling. That's the point. Had this hearing on the 10th, and you got a different ruling um, regarding. Uh, Alex Murdaugh than you've got against Parker's, but for some reason it's not premature to him. Isn't it true all you would have been enabled, all you could have gotten would have been a, a net worth statement, financial statement? Not, not even remotely close. Isn't that, that you don't, in your opinion, there's no case law out there saying that's what you get, you know, for, that's you the measure what for you punitive get damages. Now, and you don't get no upset. There's no case in your opinion as an attorney. I had seven circuit court orders where the circuit court had ruled that you don't bifurcate discovery, that it wouldn't be proper to have denied the motion, and then what are we going to do? We're going to try the case, and suddenly we're going to stop the trial and go and do the discovery? No. And so I had seven circuit court orders that I handed up to Judge Hall that supported our position. I think that that's what Judge Hall did in his order. Uh, and and, and again, Alec was you know, putting it together. Is, it's not that complicated. It's, <laughs> Does he have the ability to pay? Is he broke such that these people sh should uh, accept this pitiful offer if he could cobble? And that's sir, what that's he was doing. What you get on the motion to compel, is it? Right. You're, 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 you just said this defense attorney has a great demeanor. To pay so your client can Her make a decision on whether to accept the settlement off. offer. That is mad. not what the motion to compel is about, is it? It's about evidence for trial. The motion that's to the compel. legal standard, is it not? This was a good no, the choice. The motion to compel was about putting pressure on Alec. I didn't really give two cents about whether or not uh, he ultimately had money, because I knew he had money. I didn't need those things. The fact that he didn't want me to have them is the reason that I'm pushing it. Accurate. I just didn't know why he didn't want me to have this them is at a the class time. In, This is a class so in civil tactics more than anything. pressure on Alex. This is the it civil procedure they don't teach you in law school, is this conversation. This stuff on, on June 10th. If you're a good plaintiff's lawyer, Everything you do in a case is to put pressure on the other side. Facts. But the Facts. expectation of the outcome of a hearing on June 10th was not that you're going to get to launch a full-scale forensic audit because you had a conversation with someone who said, whose lawyer said, oh, he's, he's broke, and you didn't believe it. Not at that stage of the litigation, sir, is it? That's not what's, what's going to happen, is it? I don't think you need a full-scale forensic audit for something a five-year-old could see. Uh, <laughs> so, no. You wanted pre-trial ability to pay discovery. And this is where we end up with a trial within a trial, which is a problem. A uh, compulsive discovery, compelled, as much as so that your ears. client could decide whether or not to take a settlement offer. I know you don't like the answer, but I'm telling you, <laughs> I did not care about the answer. What I cared about was putting pressure, pressure on Alec. To get him I to settle. I think that your assessment of the law is wrong, and I didn't really care whether I got it at the end of the day. I knew he didn't want me to have it. And so that's what I was doing, was putting pressure on him. It would have suited me fine not to have ever gotten anything and to leverage it into a settlement and gone on about my way. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. So it was, the motion was not about obtaining uh, information. It's both. That may have been relevant. It's both, Count. Trial. You know it's both. It was about uh, getting information to inform whether or not you want to, your client would take a settlement offer. What I told Judge Hall was, it's they both. say he's broke. My people have lived in Hampton their entire lives. They do not believe he's broke. If he's broke, we need to open the books and let them see it so that they can show then Mallory form Beach's a, a, family that he's broke. Uh, show them about what they should do. 
it didn't it didn't have anything to do with with the trial it had to do with the case and resolving the case and and then i think we briefly touched on satterfield just to be clear they came to you the first time they came into your office or uh, any was september 21. it's it's either late august or early september um, jordan but, fax very early September and, and since now I'm thinking that since the roadside shooting whatever that ridiculousness was was the fourth He's having it, none it of it the roadside like incident but it was after well after June. oh yes 7th. this is fun for them it was after June 7th. both of them are having fun with us Thank you. Uh, both of them are having fun with us this is the defense <sighs> trying to say what he was doing is not proper him trying to explain this is the game he's like this is the game of civil plaintiffs work i don't care if you like the answer or not this is the game and we were putting pressure on alec to try to resolve for mallory beach's family because he gave the keys to the boat to his kid who then drank all night and killed someone so they were trying to hold everyone responsible in the boat case and he didn't even get into alec's behavior after the boat crash so I'm not surprised, but this was the right choice for the defense with this witness, because they the can spar without the defense getting the, snarky. Uh, they want to get under this his skin and make him look snarky, um, but I think the jury will understand he has the right to be pissed. He represents Mallory the Beach's family. That we got when it went forward. The judge hadn't seen Well, I mean, the, the outcome wouldn't have been the court will schedule a hearing. I mean, if the hearing had gone forward, what outcome do you uh, would you have expected? Well, you know, now I know that uh, Alec was working on Monday to Same. get the information together. If the objection was sufficient, there's no reason he would be getting the information together on Monday. Uh, so I could have gotten the information. Uh, but since that didn't happen, if we had argued it, I think I would have had the same outcome. Because he didn't uh, get Matt Bond, that's where we're simple. at this morning. Well, the court have issued an order. Mary Smith, right. I love it too. Some order would have issued on the motion. I love watching I, the lawyers yeah, spar. I, I would expect an order to issue. break it down. An order would have issued at some point later. And what, if it were granting your motion, what would that order say? I think it would say the same thing as well, well sir. That says a motion hearing will be will be scheduled <laughs> if necessary. It obviously, wouldn't if say necessary, that. So meaning the if they don't, well, the motion you, say if they don't give you shit, then it's necessary. I, again, it what it says is is that once Mr. Tiller gets what the information I said, what I from said. Alec, gives it to me, if necessary, if I deem it insufficient, then we'll have another hearing and we'll argue about it. So, so that's what I expect. It's a voluntary expect. disclosure, and then if you deem that insufficient, we go have a motion to compel here? That's, that's the said. way motions to compel go every single day. So <laughs> if you deemed it insufficient, if, if the court actually had to issue an order on your motion, what? You would have gotten every, you've gotten his, um, with the law firm. Oh, I hope Eric Bland testifies. I don't know that I'm asking for the law firm books. I'm asking for Alex. Right. Facts. You, know, you have gotten what, a financial statement? No. The court would have ordered uh, every account detail listed to you, all his personal accounts, just because you asked for it to inform a settlement decision? I was asking for the names of the institutions where he had accounts. I've told you that. Right, to that. subpoena. Sure. And, but that's different. And that would have been resisted me. and there would have been further litigation. This, this process Chill. would have taken George. some time, would it? If it was resisted, right? I'm not sure if what was resisted. If you got the names of the banks and issued subpoenas, there would be motions to cash subpoenas. It's stalking the yard. You're right? speculating. It's the same as you're asking me to speculate. I'm trying to talk to you about what the judge actually did <laughs> and what was actually in front of the judge. I get you don't want to talk about that, but you know, we can speculate any number of things could have happened. That at some point in the future, you would maybe get a voluntary disclosure, and if you didn't like it, then the motion would be heard. Nini Leaks compel. and Mark Tinsley at this point. That, that's, that's what you say it says, right? Well, <laughs> if we had shown up and they had made the argument that you're advancing here, then maybe in this imaginary world, there's things that didn't happen. The judge would have uh, the quotes actually coming ruled out of this we hearing. Would have, we would have a ruling on whether or not it was relevant, whether or not I was entitled to it. Um, and you'd have been relevant for Alex, but not for Parker's. Parker's is no, irrelevant there, to this there, conversation. There are different things that are being asked here. 
So and, keep and, trying to confuse the issue. And to your issue. point, if it were the same, why didn't the judge sign the same order that you say he would have done? That's not what he did. At the same time we argued the Parker's motion, we argued the motion for Alec. And so he came to two different conclusions on those issues. One is he said it's premature. The other is, is that Mr. Tiller is going to get the information, give it to the plaintiffs, and if it's not sufficient, we'll have another hearing. I don't know how you can be any clearer than that. His job is not to make it clearer, my guy. You know that. He's trying to make it clear. Look, look at Harpootlian. Is Harpootlian is like, this is what I want to ask. Harpootlian doesn't get to get up and ask. Court is spicy this morning. And I'm here for court being spicy this morning. This attorney is not suffering any of this good old boy shit either. He represents the Beach family. The things he have seen, he has seen that went on with the Beach case are disgusting, are being investigated, and are unethical. So Tins Mark Tinsley is just like, I'm not, do, wait, do you have, wait, sir, do you have your initials embroidered on your sleeve? Does he have his in initials embroidered on his sleeve? Oh my God, I love it so much. I love it so much. He's just like, I am sick of this shit. And he is so just, not going to back down. And, and this is outside the presence of the jury. So he doesn't um, have to temper his sass. For all of you that have gifted memberships this morning, thank you. I that see That day you. would not have been the, some sort of judgment day when everything unravels, correct? There would have been further activity. Maybe a voluntary disclosure, an analysis by you, whether it's adequate, another hearing if you thought it wasn't, maybe some subpoenas would go out. There was going to be some time after that. Is that fair? I think it's fair that to say that there wouldn't have been an explosion on June the 10th, but the fuse was lit the moment that that information became the sweater was unraveling. available in the case. Not as much Entered to into me, a Weezer song. but certainly to Danny Henderson, who would have, like the phone records, like some of the other materials, reviewed it before I got it. And Ellick would have known that. Boom goes the dynamite is what I mean, he's saying. In, in that analogy, isn't, aren't you really saying that the fuse was lit and the, you were going after his assets? And that fuse was going to go down until trial because you're going to go to trial against them and that's when the fuse would burn down. I think that's the fuse was saying. when he started stealing money. <laughs> oh shit. Yeah. So it wasn't lit on, it wasn't going to be lit on June the 10th. It was certainly getting a lot more oxygen. Right, but it, it's, it was lit way before and it was going to keep burning. The defense well is doing a good June. job. I, I don't know about well after, but it, it, it wouldn't have been judgment day on June the 10th, but, but he would have known it was beginning to unravel. Not Judgment Day. No further questions. Yes, Not sir. Judgment uh, Day. And that's really uh, the point, isn't oh, it, yeah. though? That Semantics. Had that hearing to take a place on June 10th, 2021, it could potentially set in motion or it was going to set in motion a process that ultimately Hill. would not have ended until there was either settlement or disclosure of that information, correct? I believe so. And so just the fact of that hearing taking place and whether it's an order or representations by the defense or whatever it is, that process, if it occurs, starts and it has an inevitable conclusion, correct? Objection. Yeah. There's only one. Objection, Leading. Yep. No lead the witness. The whole time. The whole time. If the, the hearing whole takes time. place on June 10th, 2021, what is the net effect of what could happen at that point? The discovery of everything he's done. Whether Not happens, Judgment that Day, day might time. stick. Correct. <clears throat> you had filed this motion The to defense is arguing the fuse was lit compel, before. Um, because you had been advised supposedly that out was broke and you didn't believe it. Exclusively for that reason. And you believe that if he was broke, he had to be hiding assets. And if he were hiding assets, he didn't want me to discover it, which would be the pressure point. Were you merely asking for a financial declaration uh, at this June 10th, 21 hearing? No, I, I, I was, it's broader than that, I, but I wanted the institutions because I knew I couldn't trust the number I would have gotten. From Alec. From Alec. 
He didn't you trust asked a little Alec's bit about discovery. Having not Alec looks pissed. Had certain theories yet at this point in time, such as negligent entrustment. Can you explain a little bit about why that was, if that was still out there? Mama Bear, I agree it with you. I don't think Kevin has an in in side voice. The pleadings that were on file. I mean, we John Tiller had already agreed to the amendment. Uh, it was already coming. I had shown him the videos uh, a long time before that uh, of alcohol, the Facebook, social media, likes of Paul consuming alcohol, having alcohol. Um, so only on the documents that were filed. Sir, were those issues, though, in play in your conversations with the defense? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Were those issues? The gallery is here for a spicy exchange of lawyers. The court is full I'm not, AF I'm not quite today. Following you. Which which issues? You're not following him because Creighton can't ask to open any questions. Oh, oh, absolutely no. I mean, it, the, those were. All I'm saying is, is that the, the black ink wasn't on the white paper, but John Tiller knew we had discussed. These are the issues. Creighton, stop wandering. Ah, I don't think the not judgment day sticks with the judge. I think it's a good point in front of the jury if this gets in front of the jury that this wasn't a judgment day, but you can more clearly see with this witness that Alec was fighting turning over those documents. And it's not just this witness. The power of this witness is in combined with the PMPED CFO that said Alec well, was trying to structure to you, payment fees to sure hide them from the boat case for and they didn't want to be a part of it. So those two witnesses together are very yes, powerful because it becomes a judgment day. Handed, whatever that lawyer's name was. <laughs> Mr. Barber? Yes. What's his face? We don't know her is what he just said. Whatever that lawyer's name is, the shade in this whole thing has just been immaculate. This is outside the presence of the jury and it has gotten fucking yes. feisty this morning. And I am, I am here for some feisty trial. I'm here for some interesting lawyering. I am here for the rage you know, people have for Alec Murdoch. Does it, does it help us solve the murder case? That, uh, not yet, dollars, but know, I'm here for not, it. It was not going to be enough, at least prior to the murders. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, had you come up with a number that had been conveyed that was far, far in excess of that? Uh, a demand to Alec? Yes. Yes. What was that number? And that also included uh, signing over Moselle and Edisto? Sir? It was an option. Uh, as well as a payment plan? Payment plan was an option. What was the number? It, it was, you could pay this amount, you can sign over these properties, work out a payment plan on Excuse the balance. Me? I didn't care how we got it done. It was just a matter of him doing it. What was the number? Was the payment plan an option because you believe that he still would have a lucrative law practice from which he could generate money to pay your clients. Yes. What was the number? Creighton? Creighton? Thank you, Thanks, you told us it was 10 million, but Thank you, you haven't you, elicited okay. that from this witness. You just talk about it. Next witness. Uh, I want this to be the secret conversation. Your Honor, a uh, couple things. Our next witness would be uh, Ronnie Crosby. Um, just to, to let the court know, the court indicated Friday that we had kind of already established. Uh, Here it is. As far as clear and convincing secret evidence on the law firm issues. Uh, Mr. Crosby would be here about that meeting I referenced to your honor uh, just to, to establish the circumstances of that. I don't plan at this time to get into testimony that he may offer about the circumstances of the fake forge and all of that based on your honor saying that you, you had heard sufficient evidence regarding uh, that. So I just wanted to make, make sure that was acceptable to the court. I did want to cross, cross the bridge though of this uh, meeting on June the 10th as to the circumstances of it. Uh, again, uh, and thus that if, if there was no uh, attorney-client privilege to that because of the presence of third parties, uh, then I, you know, at that time, we don't have to do it on the stand, but I, I would, you know, make myself, a, you know, in prep in the evening or whatever, privy to that particular conversation. Any other comment about the attorney-client privilege issue, uh, Mr. Griffin? Your Honor, I'm still at a loss as to what he's attempting attempting to accomplish. Well, he doesn't that. know either is the if problem. The, um, right. Some of the folks as witnesses who were there when you were there along right. with Mr. Murdoch. And so the, it is the question these witnesses are going to testify as to what Alec and I were talking about because we had 
attorney-client privilege conversations every day in this courtroom, and there are 250 people in this room. Does that mean that the conversations are not privileged? I don't think so. And so it, it really is more nuanced well, than is someone else in the room. And I don't know if they overheard anything that I talked to Mr. Murdoch about, and that's where this is going, or if, if the question is Mr. Murdoch talking to Mr. Crosby, and is that privilege, or Mr. Murdoch talking to, to Mr. Lee Coke, and is that privilege? I don't, you know, I'm at a loss here. I don't know either, but I say as far as the law is concerned that um, Mr. Griffin uh, was not the lawyer for Mr. Crosby or any other party. Mr. Griffin was solely the lawyer for Mr. Murdoch. Um, so there is no attorney-client privilege involving people that Mr. Griffin does not represent. Sure, and I guess what I'm, I'm actually trying out of an abundance of caution to protect his attorney-client privilege. I mean, Mr. Griffin says he's at a loss when I've been bending over backwards to make sure I'm not privy to something uh, that, that Your Honor might find productive. I don't know what you're seeking. There is no client, attorney-client privilege involving people that Mr. Griffin does not represent, if you have them as witnesses and you want to call them as witnesses, if there are necessary witnesses to this hearing, you may proceed. Creighton, you've already Thank thrown you. caution to the wind. To the stand. You've already thrown caution to the wind in some of your direct examinations that were more like cross-examination. So just ask the question and let the defense object. And that's what they're saying. We, we have, re all things beauty, we have fully reached the limit does not exist. Because Creighton is saying, we need the context of this conversation and the defense is saying well we can't talk to you about this conversation because we don't know what the conversation is and the prosecution's like well i don't know what the conversation is either because i've been avoiding it so now we're all going to learn together the court's taking a stretch break and i am fucking fascinated about what's going to happen i love that everybody stands up but alec alec looks like he might pass out if he stands up um so what is this conversation Oh my goodness. This is a feisty, feisty morning in court. We've had some very quotable lines. Um, like, there's a lot of papers here. Maybe you got okay. confused. That is fine. The court's like, all right, sit down. All right, feisty. Um, I missed that, Kathleen. I'm sure the chat answered. Matt Bond, that was a fascinating hearing. Um, some of Alec Murdoch's family is in court this morning already. Woo! Here we go. Thank you. Take a seat in the witness stand. State your name again for the record. Spell your last name. Um, Ronnie Crosby. Uh, Crosby, C R O S B Y. Mr. Crosby, how are you? Um, I'm, I'm okay. All right. Tell the court what your profession is and where you work. I am a, an attorney that practicing law with the Parker Law Group. And are you a uh, former law partner of the defendant, Doug Murdoch? I am. You see him in the courtroom here? I do. And where is he sitting? He is sitting between Mr. Griffin and Mr. Harpoolian at the defense table. There, that um, sound. On... And again, this is an in-camera hearing, so you understand I'm not exploring everything that might, depending on the judge's ruling, uh, be before a uh, jury. But I do want to explore a particular meeting. Uh, were you present for a meeting with, uh, in which the defendant spoke on June 10th, 2021? I was. And at this June particular 10th, meeting, would this uh, can be you tell the hunting cottage? who all was present? I'm not going to swear that I don't miss somebody because it was a, a, a fluid event. Um, my recollection is... He looks is, like he's about to puke. Um, it would have been late morning, midday, that we gathered um, at Ellick's brother, John Marvin's, John Marvin's place, which is not place. very far from uh, Almeda that y'all have been talking about. And um, I know I'd been by to see Mr. Randolph that morning uh, there was going to be a meeting uh, with law enforcement. They had given um, Ellick a couple of days uh, before they were meeting with him. And so we gathered there. This is before the I did I him. I was present. I did him so bad. Mark Ball was present. Lee Cope was present. Conversation. John Marvin was present. 
at some point, I believe, uh, and I don't remember exactly when Buster arrived. Jim Griffin uh, arrived at some point. Chris Wilson? And I want to say Corey Fleming was there. And there could have been, could have been others. This is tough right. for him. While that, uh, that group of people were assembled, did this has got to be uncomfortable for this witness. Content, but the defendant make any statements? He was Alex's uh, brother, essentially. We happened heard happened that the law firm was a brotherhood. Of he did. We were uh, there as friends. We had been with him every, starting the night of the murders, uh, every day, uh, and we were there for support. And and he went over the events of that afternoon or that evening um starting oh shit from the time he got home from work until uh the discovery of Paul where was this uh, discussion taking place was it inside outside we were in in john's house there I, I guess i don't know if he calls it a house or a hunting lodge but we were inside but largely i mean there was some in and out of the house as well, but the, the, the majority, we were all sitting in a room together, and I, I was doing more listening than talking. And uh, were these, the, the statements being made by the defendant, were they may be made, being made quietly to his counsel, or were they may be made openly to all the people in the room? Well, the statements that I heard, obviously, were being, for me to hear them, I was not overhearing a conversation that was private between Mr. Griffin and uh, Mr. Murdoch. They they did have some private conversations that the rest of us were not privy to, but... Uh, they knew the difference. So so there's a mixture of that. But there were private but conversations. But they knew the difference. You don't know what they were because you weren't privy to those, correct? Correct. And this was before, I believe, the uh, South Carolina Law Enforcement Division agents arrived on that. that this location. To be clear for the court, uh, you did at other times, aside from this meeting uh, or this discussion, have conversations with Alec about his activities the night of June 7th, 2021. They're outside of this, is that correct? Well, that's correct. I mean, obviously, uh, we He's all establishing that this uh, were is in not shock, privileged. but also wanted to try to find out what all had went on because we, uh, you know, a as we got past that that, that, that night of June 7th and the morning of June 8th were all. Y'all, I'm riveted. Um, I'm riveted. I'm nervous. Like, why am you know, I nervous? Trying I'm like, to, to help find what out what had happened and, 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 you know, who may have been a potential uh, suspect. They wanted to help. But in the, uh, this investigation and in preparation, you were instructed to stay away from those until that uh, from that meeting as opposed to the other ones that weren't in that meeting out of an abundance of caution until we could get guidance from the court as to whether or not those in any way were protected is that correct that that's correct i mean i i, I we had multiple conversations as you might expect all of us in, in, a, in a group and, and it may be pieces and parts uh, but what you and i have discussed up until now have been outside of what was discussed at on June 10th at John Marvin's house. Okay. Alex's face is giving, how could you do this to me? Uh, I don't believe I have anything further for purposes of this uh, No! Anything further. You're not going to ask further. him what was said? Creighton! He's just establishing uh, that it's yeah, not privileged. Do we have Danny to wait? Yeah, uh, I, I told you I <gasps> might miss one, but Danny was there. I don't think Danny was there at no. first, but he ultimately uh, arrived. I, and it, it and the meeting had been scheduled so that uh, it's so awkward that Jim is doing this cross-examination because he was there uh, brother Randy uh, for one and John Marvin and Buster could uh, be interviewed by sled is that correct that's correct the purpose was to uh, that sled had scheduled a time and I don't know who scheduled it and, and you're correct Randy was there um, and it was essentially going over the timeline of the evening of the seventh, because knowing that uh, that Ellick was going to be interviewed, and I think Buster was, and, and, and maybe Randy and John Marvin um, over the course of that afternoon. And you were not scheduled to be interviewed, correct? 
I was not scheduled to be interviewed. And, and Jim, now that you speak of it, I, I do think that while Mr. Randolph did not come into the meeting, he and whoever brought him over did come by right. to the tube that I'd forgotten. Yeah, and, and, and then went back to Alameda. Where he died within hours of that, I think. He, he died as we were leaving, or right after we left this meeting with law enforcement, we were on our way back to, uh, and got, Randy got a call. And that ended the did, law enforcement Did you meetings. sit in any of the interviews with, conducted by SLED in, in the car? I did not. Um, and Lee Cope was there, and he was not to be interviewed, right? That's not why he was present. We were there as uh, friends uh, to provide support and, and listen. And, and, and Mark Ball also was present? Mark was. And, and, and I know Mark had some meetings with law enforcement about some concerns that he had, not, uh, you know, about potential suspects and safety of. And um, had. You recall whether you and or Mark and Lee had given Alex some advice about how whether he needed to have a lawyer at the um, this interview? They all gave him poor advice, by the way. I don't remember that specifically, but uh, knowing uh, that you were already involved, I mean, I, it, any of us would have thought it was a good idea. Okay. What do you know whether Alex considered you and Mark and Lee? as well as Danny and to be his lawyer you know as his counsel that day no they were friends I mean, do you know what he was thinking interesting I don't know what he was thinking but he never uh, approached me as his lawyer or throughout this I, I, I never had the perception that I was representing him well did did you or trying to find in, another way to your privilege presence, Mark Ball or Lee Cope make it clear to Alec that, hey, we're, we're not your lawyers here, and if you talk to Jim Griffin in my presence, then there goes the attorney-client privilege. Nice try, Jim. Give him that warning. Why would they give him that warning? He's a lawyer, too. Mr. Griffin, we're all lawyers, I don't, <laughs> uh, other than John and Buster that were there. I don't think anybody needed to say that, and I, it never crossed my mind that when Facts. we were sitting in a room and all of us were talking that we were somehow representing Alec. Facts. No, I understand that. Facts. Um, Jim, what the it, fuck, Jim? Okay. And but, no, no, would I ever do that because I, I don't practice in the area that you do. Right. But <laughs> it's clear that Danny had an lawyer. ongoing attorney-client relationship with Alec. Is that right? He did. With regard to the uh, boating accident, he was uh, Alec's personal uh, counsel um, in the, in that. And Danny had sat in the initial interview in the uh, oh Danny's the one with the buttons that was conducted by sled agent Owen and Collin County deputy Laura Rutland on the night of June the 7th are you aware of that with yes the I was aware of that okay. and he was representing Alec during that interview as far as you know he was present uh, I, I, I don't know I saw uh, I mean I know when Alec got in the car we felt like one of us ought to sit in there with him, you know, for support because. Well, can you we say for support. certain that whenever you heard conversations uh, from Alec about his recollection of what happened on the seventh, that that there were any non-lawyers in the room, and I guess non-lawyers have been Buster and John Marvin. I mean, can you say for certain there were no non-lawyers in the room? That there were. <clears throat> that you're referring to hearing conversations of, with Alec in the group about what happened on the evening, the events of the evening of June the 7th. And my question to you is when, when Alec is making these statements, let me make it clear, were they, were they just lawyers in the room? I can tell you that John and Buster were there for points of time. Can I tell you who was sitting and where they you know, where where their John had walked out when I heard any specific thing, I, I can't tell you tell you that. I couldn't catalog um, because I said it's a, l a little bit fluid. People coming, going, you know, uh, law enforcement arriving outside, and uh, people walking out to greet them. I mean, it wasn't like a uh, 
the sled agents just showed up and it was you know some rigid this thing is when, when you the walked cavalry out showed up with four cars with the officers if you remember well. that testimony sure. okay one second your honor please i want to be in the room where it happened damn it they've only asked so far about whether this was attorney client conversations and it seems like they are not but they didn't get into the substance of the conversation if i'm the defense here i would probably ask because i would want to know but the defense hasn't gotten it in now we don't know what alex said at that meeting creighton's saving it for the jury confident it's going to come in jim griffin's not sure it's going to come in and he doesn't want it heard on video uh, this particular issue uh no i know that's a little bit different than the larger issue we've been uh dealing <laughs> with and i'll certainly be happy to argue that further uh, if, the, if court the court's like, like bring um, the jury as far as the larger issues one of the things <laughs> Uh, that we, in, in discussions with the defense, that we've stayed away from so far in testimony is the side of the road. And that might be the, the other piece of the puzzle a little bit that might need some in-camera testimony as, as I think all of this through. Uh, I do, I, and I know that we're butting up with the jury being here shortly, uh, but... Uh, that can be done at a later time. Yes, sir. Bring the jury? What time is it? No, in, anything further The jury should be in in 10 minutes. Um, evidence of other crimes aside from the side of the road not not at this time no, uh, do you have other uh, witnesses to present on any other issue at this time uh, no sir other than I, I, I had a summary Let's get to a ruling. The side of the road but uh, you know that, that would be it as, as, as again for in-camera proceedings before your honor to get a, a handle on all of the, uh, the, the sort of the uh, 404 stuff that we're talking about Alex not wiggling he is still as can be. No, that would be a good side of the road. We're going to take a break of about five minutes, and I will um, Roll. announce my decision regarding this other evidence. Oh, oh, we're going to get a ruling, y'all. We're going to get a ruling this morning. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. I'm here for it. I'm not upset by that at all. Let's turn this volume down. Um, hopefully they don't cut away and we'll be able to just stay here. Woo! This is this is a morning in court, folks. You never know what's gonna happen in trial. Some days are boring as hell. Today is not one of those days. Today was a lot. I'm gonna kind of summarize what's happened this morning as we wait for the judge's ruling. I woo hope y'all hope y'all wiggled it out. I am I am intrigued and I am loving seeing the lawyer strategy. We have finally got some legal jousting this morning and we are seeing the prosecution and the defense jousting over these witnesses and we will see what the court says. I think that last witness will absolutely come in. It's clear to me that that conversation at John Marvin's home and just to back up a little bit. Let me swoop and let's summarize. Let's swoop and summarize. Let's do it. Let's do a, let's do swoop and summarize. So this morning we are still in the 404, 403 hearings outside the presence of the jury. This is to have evidence come in, not just evidence of um, prior bad acts, but also evidence of motive some of this will go to character all of this evidence goes to really context and we've heard the court talking about that context the raise just day around these murders how much context is needed for an explanation that alec murdaugh is not just what the defense is presenting the defense is presenting this as a loving father with a perfect family and, and a perfect life and a perfect wife and everything is awesome he would never butcher his family like this. And the prosecution is like, everything is most certainly not awesome. And this is the gathering storm that was coming down on Alec Murdaugh's head in the moments and days leading up to his murder. So all of those witnesses, the judge is ready to rule on what is coming in. The prosecution is very focused on these prior bad acts. My concern with this is if the prior bad acts are all that sways this jury, if the context is all that sways the jury, that is going to be a very big issue on appeal. If there is more that the jury can take away, then we've got a different circumstance. And this can be, um, 
this we're not done with yet. We haven't seen everything the prosecution has to offer, unfortunately, because the prosecution is not done with their case in chief. I think the judge is going to allow a lot of this in. We just have to make sure, or the prosecution has to make sure, that they don't overwhelm the trial and we end up in a trial of all the other stuff and not a murder. Because at the end of the day, this is a murder trial. But we need the context. And I think the judge will allow that context in. And the prosecution is absolutely playing kind of hide and seek at the moment with what that witness is going to say about the conversation in the room. It was very, very disappointing to all of us watching at home and a very smart strategic move from Creighton Waters. We also saw a witness who was the Mallory Beach family attorney. That attorney needs to testify right after the PMPED CFO because those two testimonies together make sense. The attorney for Mallory Beach's family, the girl who was killed in the boat crash where Paul was charged with driving, the concern from PMPED is that Alec was trying to hide money from that civil action. And now we have the attorney saying, that's what we were worried about. We were worried he was hiding money. This was our biggest concern. And that's why we were trying to put pressure on him. And we were ramping up the pressure on him. Jim Griffin, not Jim Griffin, the other attorney, Barbara, is going to say, but it wasn't a judgment day. The prosecution is going to say, but the fuse is already lit. And Alec knows that it is just a matter of time before boom goes the dynamite. And Alec knows that the law firm is looking into where the money is going and the plaintiff's attorney is looking into where the money is going. So in context, there is a lot of people now trying to follow the money. And Alec knows if you follow the money, what you are going to find is fuckery. You are going to find fake forge. You are going to find him hiding money and you are going to find debt on debt on debt. But most importantly, you are going to find the theft from clients. And that's what was unraveling. The argument I haven't heard that I think they should make is that, and amongst all of this, Alex still went home and acted like everything was normal with Paul and Maggie, acted like everything was fine, not a hint that anything was out of place, but his law firm was confronting him about where the fuck that money was. And he had to know then that it was a matter of time before fake forge was discovered the jig was up and the house of cards comes crumbling down. I'm going to answer some questions. We need to see what the judge rules. I think this is coming in and then we'll start seeing repeat witnesses because they will testify in front of the jury. Once they call Mr. Crosby back, I am going to be out of my skin. I need to know what happened in that conversation. I am deeply invested. What did they say? And they don't want to give the defense any hint of what that witness is going to testify to. And I can't wait to see it. Today has been a huge change of pace, but it's outside the presence of the jury. We are still going to have to hear from the coroner. We have not heard from the medical examiner yet. We are still going to hear from Cousin Eddie, who was involved in the roadside incident and more. We know there are some very interesting witnesses to come. Week three might be the best week of this trial because um, they've laid the foundation. But again, you cannot build a circumstantial case, which this is, which is fine. You can build cases entirely on circumstance, but you cannot build a circumstantial case without a very, very strong foundation. And that's what the state's been doing. We'll see what they build up from there. Emily, have you ever seen someone puke on trial? I've seen someone puke in trial. It's been me. I'm the problem. It's me. Um, but I was... I was pregnant and I had issues with hyperemesis. So yes, I have thrown up in court during trial, but I've not seen anyone else throw up in court during trial. I've seen people look like they were going to throw up in trial. Katie asked an important question. Wouldn't this be hearsay? What Alex said is an omission of a party opponent. It is an exception to the hearsay rule because it's Alec. So what he said is allowed in. Um, Mama Bear said, probably because everyone involved looks sick. I don't know what that was referring to. It was from earlier. As a Brit can confirm, this tea is excellent. Anning, we trust your expert opinion on the tea. The flavor of my tea this morning is coffee, as most days. What a great way to start a Monday. I mean, the Monday came in hot. It has not disappointed. For our purposes, this has been a very interesting morning. Alex sometimes looks like he zones or disassociates. I don't know about that, but he definitely sometimes looks, uh, he definitely has a change in behavior. 
what they were getting to with the attorney Tinsley that testified was Alec is very good at reading people and using that to his advantage. Jim sounds nervous. Jim is in a really awkward position with all of this because he's Alec's friend and he was at these meetings. So Jim is having to like not testify, but also he knows what he remembers. It's a very weird position. And this doesn't come up where the defense attorney's cross-examining someone about something where they were there. And you, I mean, it's just such an unusual circumstance, but I love that this attorney held his ground. Look, I didn't think I was Alec's lawyer. Alec didn't think I was his lawyer. I don't practice in the area you do, Jim. We were all there to support our friend whose wife and son had been murdered. I wasn't there as his attorney. I was there as his friend. I was there to console him, not be legal counsel. And that's the line that this last witness has to hold. Um, she boogies or SH boogies. That still doesn't show motive for murder. I feel like the jury needs a motive despite it not being required. I think the jury needs the circumstance. I don't know if we're going to get a motive that makes sense, but if we get the circumstance, then we're there. But what we heard from attorney Tinsley is if Alec was a victim of a vigilante, the $10 million civil lawsuit of the boat case goes away. And if Paul is gone, the criminal proceedings around the boat case go away. Will that be enough? Alec brought up the boat case in the 911 call, in the first interview, in the second interview. It is clear that the boat case is what is on Alec's mind, that this was related to the boat case. So if you put all of that together, there's room for the prosecution to argue he lets this happens to get out from under the boat case because the boat case is what lit the fuse that was going to explode this house of cards. So that's where we're at. Um, that's where we're at. That was George hopping down there. So yes, George was George was stalking the birds out of the bird feeder this morning. It's a little warmer here in Middle Tennessee today. We've actually got some critters out in the front that he was looking at. Alex, current thoughts, if I get off, good God. I mean, we try not to speculate. Normally replay crew, but here for spicy tea today. I was here for it too. Laundered exercise regime, up, up, down, shift around, move from side to side, wiggle in the chair like you just don't care. That's what I was doing today. Perhaps Creighton doesn't want to give the defense time to prepare questions. Yes, this was strategy. Um, also didn't have 1994 Weezer on my bingo card here for this. I love Weezer. I love Weezer. So yes, we, I look, I'm old. My references are dated to the nineties. It's fine. Um, I've only had two hours of sleep after 84 hours, 84 hour work week. Hot mess. Jess, that sounds miserable. This morning spice was absolutely worth it. It was feisty. The thing Mr. Tinsley has to be careful of, we are not the jury. We get to live for all the spice. I said this during the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. When Johnny Depp was clapping back at Rottenborn, I said multiple times during that coverage, look, this could, go, this could go either way. The jury could either live for the sass and be like, yes, you did read that right. You get it. Or the jury could be like, Ugh, rude. What are you hiding? Why are you so shady? Why, what is the snark covering? So it can go either way with a jury. And I hope that if Mr. Tinsley testifies in front of the jury, that he also has an eye on how the jury is reacting and maybe, maybe dials back the sass a little bit while still standing his ground because it can be off-putting to the jury. If the jury likes this witness, the witness should let the defense attack him a little bit because then the jury will be annoyed with the defense. When the defense attacks witnesses that the jury likes, it tends to not go well for the defense. This is very much a game of strategy in front of a jury. It is a chess match and I love it. So with that, let's keep going. I don't think Creighton has a quiet voice. I agree. Creighton is, Creighton is very, very high energy um, in this trial. He's very much like, it's, it's a lot. Emily, you aren't a commentator. You are a court caster. Uh, yes. By the way, did you get the book about Brenda in the mail? I have a number of books that I have not opened yet because I wanted to open them contemporaneously and share them with you guys on social. So I have multiple books um, waiting to be opened. I have not opened them. I think court caster is appropriate. We're like, oh, damn. 
dub. He just said that. That's it's it's basically like UFC sports commentary. Shout out to Jay's, JD's legal team. JD's legal team has got to be like, does everyone love us even more now? I mean, there's days I've missed Elaine a little bit. Um, I don't miss the amount that they approached, though. They approached the bench so often. We've seen them approach the bench bench in this trial once. Yes, they've done things outside the presence of the jury. They've approached the bench once. Matt B said, by the look on Alec's face when Crosby had been testifying, sounds like it was something that Alec definitely doesn't want out in public. We're going to hear what it is. Um, Tracy says, you make me want to be a lawyer. I am a critical care nurse of 31 years, but this is awesome. It's never too late to change, right? I feel all of you are my people. Love this. Tracy, I would just suggest with the experience of being a critical care nurse for 31 years, maybe don't bother with law school. Maybe just become an expert witness and get paid to be involved and give give opinion on legal cases, um, review records, review medical records for lawyers, lawyers, especially Plaintiffs attorneys always need um always need that kind of that kind of work and that kind of help. So maybe, maybe the expert witness route. Um, because with your experience, you could definitely be an expert witness. I really hope they call that last witness back today so I can hear what was said. I'm gonna need to know today. I'm going to need to know today. Today. I'm going to need to know today. Uh judge is back. I love the monogram too. It was a major monogram. <laughs> now I'm just in, now I'm just enjoying my own jokes. If Old Yeller was a lawyer, his name would be Creighton. That's fair. This issue is before me on the Ooh. motion of the state. The judge is ruling. Made evidence pursuant to Rule 404. It's coming B in. of the South Carolina Rules of Evidence, and also under the theory of race gesto. Uh, of course, the defendant is on trial for uh, He's letting murder it of his wife and son. That's what's happening. Uh, and over he the course pissed. of the past several days, we have conducted an extensive in-camera hearing. Why are his cheeks so puffy? What is going on? The court has reviewed all of the exhibits submitted and, has, and I've considered the testimony of each and every witnesses and I have uh, concluded that the motion should be granted. Under the law of this state, evidence of other crimes is not admissible to prove the character of the person in order to show action in conformity therewith. An exception, however, exists when the evidence is offered to show motive, we did this last week. Identity, absence of mistake, the existence of a common scheme or plan. We did this last the week. The absence of mistake uh, or accident or intent. And before admitting this evidence, the court must first determine if it's relevant. Our rules de uh, define relevance as evidence having any process. tendency to make the existence of any fact that of, is of consequence to the, termination, to the determination of the case more probable or less probable than it, than it would be without the evidence. After determining relevance, the court must determine if the evidence falls within an exception to Rule 404. In determining if an exception exists, the evidence must be logically relevant to the particular purpose or purposes for which it is sought to be introduced. And this requires the court to analyze whether a logical nexus exists. Evidence is logically relevant when it reasonably tends to prove a material fact and issue. And of course, the evidence of any other crime offered uh, to be well, stop. admitted there is into so evidence much activity or proven or at council tables. Stop moving. Must be proven by clear and convincing evidence. Uh, and, and that's the what court this hearing was. To conduct and uh, required to conduct an analysis under Rule 403, which weighs the probative value versus the pr uh, prejudicial, prejudicial effect. effect. A 
according to the state. The nexus is supported by the unusual circumstances of the murders uh, in that the defendant was the last person to see his wife and son alive uh, and the one who discovered the bodies all in a relatively short period of time. The state has presented evidence in this in-camera hearing, uh, evidence of numerous financial crimes uh, allegedly committed by Mr. Murdoch. Yeah, some of those are beyond alleged. The state argues that the logical nexus between the murders and other crimes is that the looming exposure of financial crimes provided motive for the murders and is evidence of malice, an essential element of the crime of murder. On June 7th, the defendant was confronted uh, about $792,000 missing from the law firm. Beyond that sum, the state contends that millions of dollars were misappropriated by the defendant and this misappropriation would eminently be exposed. We've heard from the bookkeeper for the law firm, Jean Seconder, who testified Seconder to was confronting a fucking uh, boss witness. the defendant on the day of the murders about the missing $792,000 from a case that, she, that he worked on with attorney Chris Wilson. Chris Wilson testified. She, she had previously questioned uh, Mr. Murdoch concerning the improper disbursement of fees in the case of the state versus Hirschberger, uh, wherein it's alleged that Mr. Murdoch sought to put the fees in the name of his wife, Maggie, to hide them from discovery in the boat case. She testified that the firm conducted a forensic audit, Is which then documented millions of dollars of misappropriated funds because his by judge the stare is giving funds that the law firm had to replace Brooks judge stare the defendant the defendant and his son Paul uh, have been sued following the fatal boat crash and the defendant had been served a motion to compel production of his financial information On the day of the murders, I'll get there to break. Uh, according to the testimony, the defendant was preparing for the motion to compel, which had been set, to, which was set to convene in three days. We've heard testimony from Jan Melanowski, the president and CA, CEO of Palmetto State Bank. Y'all, y'all enjoyed the president and CEO of Palmetto State. Who no testimony and documentation. Not that to one. The one from Forge. Y'all loved. Owed by the defendant to Palmetto State Bank. All while the defendant was frequent, frequently carrying a substantial negative account balances. That three hundred and fifty thousand dollar overdraft is what the judge is talking Gunn, about. A consultant with Forge Consulting testified that make the, the chat defendant thirsty. created a fake bank account using the firm name of Forge. Fake Forge. And according to the testimony of Ms. Seckinger, this fake account was used as main depository for, for a substantial, if not most of the um, misappropriated appropriated funds. We heard testimony from attorney Chris Wilson about confronting the defendant about the missing $792 and the uh, personal um, <coughs> sum to him owed of $192,000 was later discovered 
And he's, that, uh, that testimony or that confrontation took place um, on June 7th. Uh, Mr. Murdoch later confessed to having stolen those funds along with committing a multitude of other crimes. Well, the jury's going to hear from Chris Wilson. They're going to be. Claim to be suffering from uh, drug addiction. Fascinated by that. I heard from Michael Satterfield, who Mr. Murdoch stole from, according to him, represented in a in a lawsuit against himself involving the death of Gloria Satterfield, uh, Michael Satterfield's mother, who was the housekeeper of Mr. Murdoch. He testified that he'd heard of the. Uh, through the reports that money had been recovered in the case and when he discussed it with Mr. Murdoch, Mr. Murdoch told him that no money had been recovered and it would take a year or so. Um, it was later revealed that money had been recovered and that um, a confession of judgment was later issued in the sum of $4,304,000. The judge's summary is very also good. Also received testimony from Mr. Uh, Carson Burney from the State Attorney General's Office who traced funds in and out of the bank account. I find that the jury is entitled to consider whether the apparent desperation of Mr. Murdoch because of his dire financial situation, uh, the threat of being exposed uh, for committing uh, the crimes which he was later charged with, uh, resulted in the commission of the alleged crimes. And while motive is not a necessary element, the state must prove malice and evidence a motive may be used to prove it. And in this case, since the identity of the perpetrator is a critical element that must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, evidence of motive may be used in an attempt to meet that burden. Now, this evidence of other crimes is admissible and it's non-propensatory as it does not suggest to the jury that the defendant has a tendency to commit murder. Just shows the circumstances. I specifically of find that these other crimes will not lure the jury into declaring guilt on a different ground or than the specific charge. Which is what thus it's not, they need to be cautious of. Thus it is non-propensatory evidence and supported by state law. Therefore, this non-propensatory evidence of other crimes is admissible under Rule 404B and Rule 403. Danielle, we'll hear from all of those other witnesses and more from them. Which may be prejudicial, but it's more probative than prejudicial. As to race geste, the state alleges that race geste is circumstance. Mr. Murdoch was under an immense pressure after being confronted about the missing fees, the upcoming hearing on the motion to compel his financial information, his dire financial straits, and looming exposure of this criminal activity. And the state contends that uh, that led, that situation led to the murder of Maggie and Paul Murdoch. Our courts have held that where evidence of other crimes he is making is an integral a part of record because this will be appealed if he's for which a defendant is charged or it is needed to aid the jury in understanding the context with which the crime occurred then that evidence is admissible under the theory of race geste or race gestae, um, as some might pronounce it. 
<laughs> I find that Shade. the activities and conduct. The defense tried to correct his pronunciation last week. On June 7th, 2021, as testified to, is admissible under race geste. And that this That's evidence funny. furnishes a part of the context of the alleged crime. It's necessary to the full presentation of the case which the state is entitled, uh, particularly since the state is relying heavily on circumstantial evidence. I find that it is so intimately connected with and explanatory of the crime charge under the theory that the state um, is seeking to prove that proof of it is essential to complete the story. And our courts have further declared that where the full presentation of the evidence is admissible, that there is no reason to fragmentize the events under inquiry by suppressing parts of the race geste. Further in State v. McGee, uh, the court held that where um, race geste, evidence of race geste, I wonder if Alex never of heard of race geste, is properly admitted, then no 404B or Lyle analysis is reached. However, as to the finding of admissibility of evidence, which I have done, and the finding of it within the race geste, I've nevertheless conducted a Rule 404B analysis. He sure has. He's Lyle marking analysis, his record for the appeals court. No, not needed. In conclusion, the state's motion to admit the other evidence or evidence of other crimes is admitted. I will file a more formal order, Written order. granting the state's motion later. That's a big today. ruling. That's a big ruling. Are the we ready defense for the is jury? going to I we are. object. Your Honor, one, one point for the record. Your Honor's ruling, I, I don't know that they're getting into the financial stuff immediately, but we do have a proposed limiting instruction that we would request the court to give. Yeah. The defense was the ready for this ruling. The okay. so. Yeah, thank you very the much. The defense and, was ready for this. And um, certainly upon request of the defense, the court is required to give a limiting instruction. So the defense is ready for that. That's appropriate. The defense had to know this ruling was coming. This judge has signaled that this was going to be the way that they would rule. He has made a very thorough record because this is grounds that cases get overturned on. Cases get overturned on allowing in prior bad acts to prove that somebody did this it bad act. Be laid out it's for not propensity in this case. To cross into some of those financial ways. It's not. Uh, have you reviewed um, the defendant's proposed limiting instruction? right now your honor it's not more probative than prejudicial there's a model instruction they might be trying to rewrite the instruction there's a model instruction on this the judges ruled it's not more prejudicial than probative so the witnesses that we have heard in 404 will be coming in in this trial and there is an instruction that will tell them that that evidence alone is not sufficient but it will go a long way towards how the jury sees this case and the circumstances of this case Identity is an issue, and you heard the judge say motive can go a long way to showing the identity of who did this, who benefits from this, and is it is it the Mallory Beach family? They're going to say this was a vigilante because of the boat case. Well, they're going to be able to collect less money from Alec because of these killings, so does it really benefit anyone connected with the boat case, or does it benefit Alec. And that is what the judge is ruling. I think it's a fair ruling. I think it's a carefully considered ruling and it has to be. The judge laid it out thoroughly. The judge will put this on the record because if Alec is convicted, this is going to be one of the biggest grounds for appeal. And that is something, again, as I've, I'm going to just reiterate myself, 
This is a grounds that uh, cases get overturned on. So the judge needs to make a thorough record. It's why he allowed all of these hearings so that the appeals court would have a record of how and why the judge made the decision that he made. He is allowing it in. I think he is, um, I think he is right in that. I think the defense has very much taken the tack of this person couldn't do this and the prosecution has a right to rebut that. Um, if we could get the volume back on in the courtroom while Creighton is talking, that would be awesome. But apparently the audio is still cut. These well, are, thank you. This, um, and this is After the testimony or before the testimony? No, it needs to be given with before the rest of the- Before the testimony is offered, Your Honor. It should be given with the rest uh, of the instructions. Uh, what? Switching feeds, switching feeds immediately. And obviously it has uh, the next and last sentence as it's being allowed and it makes a specific representation about the state it only refers to motive not identity it's more before a four not arrest just day i don't know that that sentence is necessary uh the last sentence i think also has a typo in it um but uh i, I would uh um generally though i have no problem with this charge and i have no problem with it beginning uh, being given before such financial uh, evidence is received you don't have to those witnesses will testify Later today or tomorrow? Probably not late today, but almost certainly tomorrow. All right. Well, you have an opportunity to submit your own proposed limiting instruction or to confer with defense counsel and see if you all agree. Absolutely. We'll work on that, Your Honor. Yeah. Of course, the I mean, yeah, the other question of race just day and whether or not a limiting instruction is required. We'll get there. We don't have a new race witness yet. Just day testimony. No, I understand, Your Honor. And I guess I understood the scope of the court's ruling to go beyond rest just day or just die. It did. Include um, prior, prior events that didn't, that weren't, he wasn't confronted about on June 7th. Now, if, if the court's ruling is limited to if the confrontation on June 7th and about that transaction, then then it would be rest just on. It's not limited yes. to June 7th. June, June 7th also includes race just day, but the ruling includes um, all evidence of financial crimes that may likely have led to the mo a motive or lend itself to motive for the crime committed and that may be for before or after yes, I, I um, and the court's ruling i will for the record when it's offered just make a formal objection to protect the record yes know? sir i understand showing no disrespect to the court no i understand he's doing okay we're that ready was for the a jury Stay Stay it. Bring them on. Bring them on this morning instead of bring the jury. That's a big ruling from the judge and the prosecution needs to be careful. They need to make sure that this does not become a trial on the financial crimes, but remains a homicide trial. This at the end of the day is a murder trial. And if the prosecution overwhelms the evidence that they present on the financial crimes and not on the murder, it leaves them very open on appeal. Then again, appeals, you know, are for losers. So if the state does not convict Alec Murdoch, there's no grounds for appeal anyway. So that is a balance that they absolutely have to strike. This is common evidence that comes in. It is not substantially unusual. It's just that that balance needs to be careful on how much you bring in. This should not be an entire an entire trial on prior bad acts. How is it not raised just a, no it is. And Hobson, it absolutely is. Thank That's you, good morning. Appropriate. The judge, right at noon. The judge is allowing oh, 11 it. 11.58, it's still morning. The, ju uh, <laughs> the judge is allowing day it. day number 11. I'll call your next witness. For an hour, we've got an hour of testimony. Who are you? State of South Carolina would now call Miss Michelle Smith. To the oh, oh, it's the My Cousin Vinny prosecutor. He wanders around too. All right, the jury is present. 
I was talking, I think he said Michelle Smith. We will see um, when she swears in. <clears throat> so this is a big day for the prosecution. They did a good job in their hearing, presenting the evidence. The prosecution is not doing a good job of asking non-leading questions. We affirm the testimony about the court and this trial shall be the truth, so help you back. Yes. Thank you. Take a seat and with the same state your name again for the record. Spell your last name. Oh, I am living for Michelle, this necklace. Shelly Smith. You take a big breath. Yes. What is your first name? Michelle. Spell that, please. M U S H E L L. Where did you get that name from? My auntie named me. And where did she get that name from? I don't know. <laughs> Sir, do not ask her about her entire Michelle family with tree. Let's move the U. U. Yes, correct. Um, during the course of this, if you don't mind, is it okay if I call you Miss Smith or Miss Shelley or Shelley? I really don't know what's going to come out of my mouth sometimes. Is that okay? That, that's okay. <laughs> but do you go by Shelley? Yes. Please tell these folks, um, Miss Smith, about Michelle Smith, um, where you were born, where you were raised, please. Hampton, South Carolina. And, and ma'am, if you, if you don't mind, just pulling this up a little bit. Her necklace is great. Okay. Thank you. She Thank seems you. a little nervous. I'll be interested to see what she's testifying about. Go ahead. I was born in Hampton County. Um, have four grown kids. I was born in Hampton County, four grown kids, six, eight grands, and I nice. worked for the Hampton County District for the last 28 years, full service. That's my professional. Pull, pull that chair up. I just want you to be comfortable. That chair? There's nothing comfortable about that chair, counsel. Four adult kids. Yes. And then you said six to eight grands. Eight grands. Eight grands. Eight grands. Okay. And um, raised where? Hampton, okay. South where Carolina. She said Where'd you go to high school? Wade Hampton High School. Let let her be. What did you do after high school, Ms. Smith? Um, got married. <laughs> we, um, raised my kids. We don't need her whole and, life, um, counsel. That's good. my profession. I said. Mm -hmm. I'm ready for it, but we yeah. don't need and her. That whole is life. the hardest profession, raising children. Yes. You got you had four kids. Four kids. And when you were raising them, um, you were raising them, taking care yes. of them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And is it, are you in your family here today? Yes, my brother and my daughter. Who's what's your brother's name? Um, Michael Smith. Michael Smith, will you stand up? What? What is the point that's of this? Brother. Yes, that's my brother. And who else is here? My daughter, Rochelle. Miss Rochelle, will you stand up? Yeah, Alex. Like, Thank what you. is it? What is the point of all they of this? They here supporting you today. Y yes. <clears throat> Don't take this the wrong way, but other than raising a family, which is the hardest job, were you doing any, doing anything else during that time period? No, until 1995, I started working at the school district. Okay. Did you work in your church while you were raising your yes, family? Yes, I worked at church. Okay, and that's what I'm asking. What yeah. did you do with your church while you were raising your family? Usher, uh, sure. kitchen ministry. Kitchen ministry? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And um, how long did you do that? Oh, my, all my life, church. Are you still doing that? Yes. Okay. And, and you don't have to name your church, but where, where, where is your church located? Fairfax, South Carolina. So at some point after your children moved up in years or mm -hmm. got older, did you start another profession? Yes. Okay. And tell the ladies and gentlemen what that was, please, ma'am. Private home care. I'm sorry? Private home care. Caregiver. There it is. How did she's you get into that? the caregiver. Uh -huh. This is the caregiver for Alex's mom. Business? Yes, she's an LPN. There we go. Yes. An LPN? Yes. Licensed practical nurse. Yes. And, and when did you get into home care? Uh, business Probably about 10 or 12 years ago Fine. now prior to that had you already started with the school yes I still at the school also okay tell them when you started with the school it's school in 1995 if that's correct 1995 and in, in what school did you start with at North Central Middle School in Warrenville South Carolina North Central Middle Warrenville North District Middle School North. yes what did you do for them Food service. This council has done this. And how long did you do that at that every school? Witness. I've been there for 19 years at North Central Middle School. Every witness, he's he's done direct After for that, it. Did you uh, change? Yes. Locations? Yes. Yes. Six years later, I went to Wade Hampton High School. Mm -hmm. We don't need her whole life, council. He's done it with every that. witness. Warrenville, South Carolina. He's, and 
humanizing been there her to the years? jury, which is fair. Oh, no, six years in the way Hampton High School. Okay. So total years in the school system is what? 28 years. Okay. And you're still there? Still there. So you started home health care while you were still teaching school? Or no, still going to school? Going to school. Right? Mm -hmm. service. And um, will you please tell them, you said your aunt got you in business. Were you working with one family at a time, or did you have different families at a time? Okay. Different families. And how long would you stay with the family once you became their caregiver? It all depends on how long they, if they're deceased, I will move on to some another family. So is it fair to say you stay with the family until the person passed on? Passed on, yes, correct. And then how did you get other jobs as far in that caregiving profession? My aunt always called me and said they had a job, and she let me put me on that job. So give the jury an idea before we get to this case, your schedule would be what when you were, you were still working at school? Yes, at school. Getting. This yes. woman is working okay, a lot. So how would you, what was your typical day like? My typical day was I leave home at 7.20, have to be to school at 8 o'clock that morning. And I would stay there until a quarter to two, make my deposit for the school, then leave and go to my previous next job. So this is going to be the caregiver for Alec's mother, who was there when Alec came over the night of the murder. This is going to be very can you, interesting can, testimony. Can you tell this jury, Ms. Smith, how it came about that you started working for the murder? Um, it was a job opening. I think one of the caregivers um, mentioned it to me, and I said, yes, I'd be interested in going. And now that's how it started. And one of the caregivers mentioned your name. Do you know who that was? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. It's Barbara Mixon. It's Barbara Mixon? Yes, sir. So there's an opening, and your name got brought up? Yes. And can you tell uh, she folks is, when that was? does not when seem did you happy start working for, um, to be testifying the against Alec Murdoch right now. October of 19, 2019. And I do not blame her. I think counsel would do well to stand with his back to Alec and block Alec from Libby, staring at her. Libby, he should stay there. Stop was moving, Mr. counsel. Uh, Randolph, I knew him as solicitor Randolph uh, mm -hmm. Murdoch, but was Mr. Randolph, was he there living yes. when you started there? Yes, he has, yes. And then that's what we've referred to as Almeida? Yes, Almeida, yes. He should stand with his back Who to was, Alec. What was your primary job as the Alec caregiver? Were you, were you there to take care of uh, solicitor or Mr. Randolph, or was your primary job for Miss Libby? Miss Libby. Okay. Did you also ever tend to Mr. Randolph's? Yeah, every now and then. Mm -hmm. But your main focus was Miss Libby. Miss Libby, yes. Counsel. From October 19th up to June 21st, Miss Smith, and I want to be very delicate in this question. <laughs> I think it's something that's affects everybody in the world, this jury there, but did Miss Libby's condition get worse? Yes. Block and, um, him out. She's suffering from something that affects all our families, it's Alzheimer's? Yes. These are all leading That got worse from the time you started until June? Yes. The defendant does have a right to see the people testifying, but he can block her view of him, but he can absolutely stand there until defense asks him. He should make the defense ask him to move, and he should stand well, there and protect his witness. How would you describe Miss Libby's condition? Or he should stand right next to the jury box so um, she's looking at the jury and not at Alec at all and let the jury see you know, Alec. Could remember anything at times. Stare. In your opinion as her hair caregiver, was she aware of what was going on around her? No, no. This audio is really tough because they gain it up so much. I I'm specifically, sorry. in June of 2021, Ms. Smith, or May, June of 21, tell these folks what your school schedule was and then your work schedule with the Murdoch. You already told that. My school says schedule Move was on. 720, I will leave home, be to school at 8 o'clock, and I leave there at 145. Go home, make my deposit at the bank, go home, rest, come back to work at a quarter to 8. Had to be there at 8 p.m. that night. I will stay all night and leave 
a quarter to eight the next morning, leave there and go back to the school. So was that the shift you were working for the Murdoch's? Yes. Primarily? Yes. From 8 p.m. to 8 a.m.? Yes. Mm -hmm. When did you sleep after you went to school? I took little cat naps every night and then. Not enough. Oh, would you go home after you made your deposit? Yes. You would rest? Yeah, that's for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. And then did you have a change of clothes at the Murdoch's for when you went straight to school the next morning? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, ma'am, I'd like to take you to June 7th of 2021. If you'll go back there, if we can take them back in your mind and take this jury back there right now, please, ma'am. She's like, um, I wish that had never you happened. Working as a caregiver for Miss Libby Murdoch on June 7th of 2021. Yes. Now, had Mr. Randolph, again, I don't know Ms. Lister, but had, had Mr. Uh, Randolph's condition worsened? Had he gotten, was he in the hospital? Was he there when you got there on June 7th? All no, he was not. Do you know where he was? He was in the hospital. Good. What time did you get to the uh, uh, Murdoch's? Ms. Libby's residence and Mr. Randolph's residence on June 7th of 2021. Quarter to eight. Okay. And that's the time you were there? Yes. And you're never late, are you? No. Okay. And, where, and it was is somebody waiting to, to leave Kiki, for you to get But there? it's a murder yes. trial. Okay. We need this to get night, who was there? To what happened. Ms. Barbara Mixon, I'm thinking. I can't remember. I think it was Barbara. I'm sorry. Understanding your words. Um, can you speak maybe louder? Okay. I, yes, I know you can't change She's your voice. She's so but nervous. Yes, sir. A little louder, please. Or closer to the mic. Can you tell tell us what Miss Libby, when you got there on June seventh of twenty twenty one, shortly before eight? Where was Miss Libby? In the bed. And as a professional caregiver, and this was what time of night? Eight o'clock that night. If one of your patients that you're taking care of is in the bed resting, do you like to disturb them? No. If they're sleeping, do you want to wake them up? No. So when you got there, was Miss Libby in bed? She was in bed, yes. This audio is and you get bruised by Miss Mixon on what happened during the day, or y'all exchange, say, you know, is come in, you know, change her if she needs to be changed or whatever like that. Make sure that she's dry. Yeah, she's dry. It's okay. Yes. And then, so where's your desk? What's your what's your position when you're there? When you're in her room, Miss Libby's room? Yes. Okay. Where are you? Where, where's your, where do you sit when you're in the room? I mean, what do you do to, to help take care of her? In a, in a recliner. Have the recliner. Sit there. And uh, is there a TV in the room? Yes. Mm -hmm. And do you, is the TV usually on when you're there with Miss Libby in the evening? Or does it... Yes. Okay. Was it on this night? It was on, yes. And do you remember what y'all were watching? What, what was on TV? American Says, a game show. Say it again. American Says, the game show. Okay. How long has that been on? What? What? Why it's is on. this relevant? How would she know? Stays on. It's repeats. It's afterwards. It repeats itself. Oh, he the didn't mean how channel. long in total. How long um, that evening? The Game Network show. Channel. Excuse me. At some point on the evening of June seventh of twenty twenty one, did you see Alex Murdoch? Yes. Okay. Do you remember what time it was? Um. Approximately. The game show was on, so it had to have been um, 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9.30, somewhere up in there. 8.30, 9.00, 9.30? Yeah, somewhere up in there. Okay. Is it fair to say it was later in the evening? It was late in the evening, yes. Okay. And you had worked that schedule for that 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. shift for how long? Two years. How often did he come Two over years. at that time of night? Two years. How often did he come over that time was of night? Was it unusual Look to see face. Alex Murdoch? at that residence that time of night? Yes, on my shift, yes. And that's the only shift you'd work? Yes. 
So the 8 p.m. to the 8 a.m. shift, it was unusual to see Alex Murdoch there visiting, correct? Leading. Correct, yes. All leading. Have you ever been over there before that time of night? I think different off and on. It dep all depends. When he got there, can you tell the jury um, what happened? The jury can see Alex's face just as well he as we can. He called the house and told me he was outside. He called the house? Mm -hmm. Yes. What, what phone did he call? Um, it's a terrible question. I mean, was it your phone, the it house phone? It was a terrible question. Phone. House phone. Okay. And when you answered the house phone, uh, what did he say? He was outside. He let him in. He was at the house. Yes. Right outside the house. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he called you. Yes. And he said, "Let me in." Mm -hmm. Yes. Leading, leading, and leading, leading, he leading. You, um, how long did it take you to go open the door to let him in? About five, about five minutes. So he was right there mm -hmm. at the house. Yes. You let him in. Of course, yes. We have the call log of when he called. Shorts okay. and a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what kind of shoes he had on? It was cloth, cloth shoes, like Sperry's, that type of material. Like Sperry's, that type of material, cloth shoes. Cloth shoes? Yeah, like cloth. I mean, yes. And you said something called Sperry's? Something like Sperry's, that, you know, that kind of, but it was cloth. I know what you that mean. Kind of, yeah. Wasn't boots? No, it wasn't boots, no. And are you familiar with tennis shoes? Yes. Was it tennis shoes? No, it wasn't tennis shoes. Cloth, Sperry type shoes? Yes. Did he have any socks on? No, no. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, um, Stop moving, counsel. Alex Murdoch's demeanor on June 7th when you were there with him and his mother Libby? He just How came. was he acting? Like, fidgety, this came in in his... Speak up, please. Fidgety, mm -hmm. like fidgety, thinking it's normal. What like he was fidgety. Like he was fidgety. fidgety. Yeah. Fidgety. Yes. Okay. And um, um, did he tell you why he was there? No, he just came to see his mother. Okay. Did he talk to his mother? Mm -hmm. She was asleep. Yes. She was asleep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what did he do? What did Alex Murdoch do when his mother was asleep? He came and sat on the bed because we were actually well watching. I said, "American says," I said, "A game show." Did he did he say anything to his mother? He said, "Hey, mom, how you doing? You know, just came to check up on you." Yeah. Did he say why he came to check up on her? Because dad was in the hospital. You know, called him handsome. Yeah, was in the hospital. And in your opinion, as being there, her caregiver, did she even know that he was there? No. The, the objection is overruled. You said no? No. Not that no. How long did he stay in the room with y'all? I say y'all, for the record, you and Miss Libby, I follow John. About 15 to 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Was he moving around the room? No, he was laying on the bed. Did he have his phone with him? Yes. Was he looking at his phone? Yes, he was on his phone, yes. I'm sorry, ma'am. Yes. Mm -hmm. After that initial conversation, you said he said, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Did he have any other attempt to have any other conversation with this lady? No. Did he hold your hand out? Did he ever hold her hand? Yes, he did hold her hand. Did you talk to her? Yes, she was in the bed, yeah. Yes, yeah. And her condition then was what? She was, you know, sleep off and on, sleep. Did he bring anything over? How long did he stay there? She already said, counsel, yeah, asked, asked and answered. That's okay. 20 minutes, 20 minutes. That was, an improper, that was a proper ask and answered. 20 minutes. She About said 20 minutes. 15 to 20 minutes. What happened after that? He left. Mm -hmm. Your shift ended when? 8 o'clock the next morning. 
At some point after that, did you get a call from Ms. Bateson? Yes. Okay. She already testified that he was wearing shorts, a t-shirt, yes. mm -hmm. and cloth, like coat shoes. Period. At some point after that, did you get a call from a family member? I'm, I really don't know who it was. But yes, you, yes. Do you remember who it was? Yes. Okay, who was it? It was Randy. Randy, Randy Murdoch. Randy Murdoch, yes. Alex Murdoch's brother. Yes. And as a result of that, what was a... All leading. Were you expecting people to come over after that? No. After that phone call, were you expecting people to come spend the night that yes. night? Yes. Okay. Who? Who was going to come over? Um, Randy told me um, John Marvin, um, Buster and his girlfriend, and Alex. John Marvin, mm -hmm. Buster and his so girlfriend. So they went and stayed at Mom's house yes. after the murders. And did you, in fact, see them later on that night? Or oh, that morning, the next morning, I'm sorry. Did they come to Almeida after you got the call from Mr. Randy saying they were coming? Did they come? Yes, they came, yes. And at some point later on that morning, did you see Alex Murdoch again? Did you see him again that morning? Just no. let her answer. Did he ever come looking for glasses? That morning, that night, he was in there. He came with glasses. He said he couldn't sleep. What? Counsel, you need to ask a better question. Because what? When did he come looking for glasses saying he couldn't sleep? Counsel! Also, can we talk Randolph about the sheriff's Mr. glasses? Randolph died. Because those are fucking fantastic. Shortly, a couple of days after that? Yes. Now, you were working the 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Counsel, shift. back up! Were you asked to work more after this to get the family through this? Yes. You asked to help more at the house? Yes. Mm -hmm. Counsel! And were you happy to do that? Of course. Ask one question and let her answer. Of, uh, Mr. Uh, Swiss, I'm going to this way I know. Swiss Randolph's funeral. Yes. And, and, and I've been reading through all this stuff here. What's a repass? A repass is when everybody come back after the funeral and eat. Everybody comes back and eat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, after the funeral, do people come to Alameda? So sort of like a visitation after a funeral? Yes. Okay. So wake council. Did folks come over there then? Yes. Okay. And was the family there then? Yes. And during this um, repast, visitation, where were you? What, and I said, what was your job during that? Or what were you doing during the visitation? I was in the room with Miss Libby. With Miss back and forth. And, and, and sometime that afternoon, did you see Alex Murdoch? Yes. Okay. Tell the jury about that, please. He came in the room, you know. Did you speak up, please, ma'am? He came in the room and speak that, you know, spoke like he always do. And, and what did he tell you? Oh dear. That he was sitting at the house. He was at the house. Say it again? He was at the house. What did you understand him to mean? And I'm not 100% following you. He was telling you or saying to you that he was at the house? Mm -hmm. What? Um, the night of the murders. The, the night, night of the murders? Yes. And what was he telling you about that he was at the house the night of the murders? That he'd been there 30 to 40 minutes. Was he telling you that? Did he ask you anything about Counsel. that when he was talking to you? Pause and let her answer. She is clearly upset. This is hard for her. Give her a second. Let the jury see her yes. process. Give her space. Did he indicate to you what he wanted you to do with that information? No. Mm -hmm. No. What That's did it. he say? He just said that he was at the house. The 34 minutes, I said. He said what? Was he there 30 or 40 minutes that night? Let her answer. Not to my recall. Why are you crying, Ms. Because they're a good, fam a good family, and I love working there. And I'm sorry all this happened. They're good people, you know. But he wasn't there no 30 or 40 minutes, was he? No. No. Can't lead the witness. It is leading. What counsel's not bringing out that, clearly that is that Alec was telling you? her 
What's the word? To you tell right people. Now? Yes. He was at. Did you call anybody about it? My brother. He was at mom's house. You called your brother after that conversation with Alan? Yes. To tell him about that conversation? Yes. She's saying he was telling her to tell people that he was at mom's house 30 to 40 minutes when he was only there 20 minutes. Council did not make that very clear and council needs to make that more clear. And just to be clear. What did you understand him to mean? What was the statement he said about how long he was here? 30 to 40 minutes. What did you but understand his phrase him to was, mean? I was here or you know I was, I was? I was here 30 to 40 minutes. I was here. That's more clear. I was here 30 to 40 minutes is much more clear. That is very big I'm testimony. Surprised, but I can't help it sometimes. What else is going on in your life right there? This, um, just working. I was an hours. You're really, you're whispering. I don't understand what you're saying. She's very upset, Your Honor. I want well, to give her a married. hug. I was, I was planning on getting married. I was planning on to. And, and had Alex Murdoch mentioned anything to you about your upcoming nuptials? Yes. And, and when was that? It was the day after was, I'm thinking. The day after this? I'm, I'm thinking it was, after yes. the conversation yes. you said? Where were you? At the, city, at the house. And uh, what did he say about your marriage, your upcoming potential marriage? I heard you was getting married. I said, yes. He said, back at um, you just let me know because I know wedding's going to be expensive. I said, well, thank you. The wedding's going to be expensive? He said, the wedding's going to be expensive. That's well, thank you. Did he offer to help? Yes, he offered. He offered. That's the type of person, a good person. And have you ever mentioned the wedding to you before? No. Mm -mm. Had you mentioned that to him before? No. Uh -uh. Oh. Hey, did he th have a conversation, any anything else about your job? Were you working at the school? Yes, at the school, yes. Did Mr. Murdoch mention to you about your school and your position there? Yes. Tell him what um, he said. He said that, um, you know, if you need a position at school, you know, my good friend is there. I said, yeah, I know, worked at the school, the principal. Council, you need to slow down with him trying to take care of her, him trying to make sure that her wedding's taken care of. This is a, you know, I can you help you, right? You, did you help out more than just your regular shift the rest of this week? Yes. That week after Slow down, yes. counsel. The murders and solicitor Murdoch's death. Were you working full time then trying to help? Yes. Was school out then? No. So were you still going to school and helping? Still, yes. And after Mr. Randolph's funeral, did you have an occasion to see um, Alex Murdoch early one morning? Yes. Um, early when? Do you know how long it was, how many when? days after the funeral, Mr. Murdoch? Three days, I think, three days. Can you tell the, uh, ladies and gentlemen of this jury, um, yes, what time it was in the morning that you saw Alex Murdoch? 6.30 that morning. Say that again. 6.30 that morning. It's early. And that had been a part of your regular like 8 to 8 a.m. Yes. And uh, she seems to have a lot of care for this family. You no. You didn't? Mm -hmm. well, did not Had he called you on June 7th and told yes. you he was coming? Yes. And he was right outside the house? Yes. All leading. And this morning at 6.30, he did not call you? No. How did All you know leading. he was on the premises? He knocked on the by the bedroom near the window. Not? Yes. Council! Well, did you hear him say anything after that? He said, I'm outside. Say it again? I'm outside. What? Had he ever been there at 6 or 30 in the morning before that? Why, you were working there? No, sir. Never? No. Mm -hmm. And tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you observed that morning when you saw Alex Murrow. He came in the, the white, in the white truck. Came in the white truck. Well, there's still. 
Um, um, and then what? Just ask her, and then what? Stuff's not in the world, Road. There's still funeral equipment in the yard. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like what? The tent was still there, and the, um, the big old building, they, they, they put the food in, had out there. Like, oh, yeah. like a food truck? Yeah, food truck. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Was that blocking your view, so? Yes, it blocked my view, yes. Leading. So when you saw Alex Murdoch this morning at 6.30, what did he do after he knocked on the door? Did you let him in? Yes. Then what did he do? Came inside. And then? And uh, was Miss Libby sleeping? Yes, she was still sleeping. Okay. Did he go check on Miss Libby? No. Stop leading. No. Just ask her what he happened next. I can't remember. I can't remember. Well, what did he do then? He came inside. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what? And, uh, did he have anything or was he holding anything? <clears throat> he had a blue something in his hand. Say that one more time. A blue, tar blue something in his hand. Something blue. A blue something in his hand. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Size. Can you show me how he was holding it? Like right. this. Is it right if I touch it? Yeah, this one. How, how was he doing it? Like this. Like that. Holding it. something like this. Yes. Describe it what for the record. Like? like a blue tart. Like a tart. Blue? Blue. Okay. Was it vinyl? It's like a tart that you put on a car, you keep your car covered up. Big thing. Yeah, blue. Yeah. And was he holding it like this? He was holding it like this. Could you tell if there like was what? anything in it or do you know? No, I couldn't tell. Say it for the record. But not holding like this. Mm -hmm. Did he say anything when he walked in? No. What did he do when he walked in? Went upstairs. Make course notes. <sighs> there is really important testimony here that is is getting muddied up in the disorganization of counsel's questions. The reason I say mark it for the record is because when she's holding her hands like somebody's holding a package, what you do, because the appellate court can't see what her arms are doing, you say, for the record, the witness has indicated her arms as if someone is holding a baby or a package. You state what they're doing with their hands for the record. She is a very critical witness, and the state is still not clear. They are not letting her just tell her story because the state is asking these leading questions that are more closed-ended. They need to let this witness talk, in my opinion. She is having a hard time already with testimony. Let her talk. She seems very uncomfortable. She clearly has a lot of love for this family. Just let her talk and then highlight the key points of what she's saying. But we know the police later recover this tarp this and it has gunshot residue on the inside. A tarp or a, a raincoat. But this is frustrating to watch because there is so much information this witness has and he is not letting this witness say it. Right, Mr. Murdoch came in your uh, Alameda residence that morning. This is her show, not this yours, counsel. This is page 223. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? Upstairs, going upstairs. And is that where he went, Alex Murdoch, that morning? Yes. Still hasn't Carrying identified who Alex thing. Murdoch is mm -hmm. also. And this Normally may be you do that first. If it is, I'm sorry. That's 222. Same stairs, same house? Yes. Stage so, 413. What is this? That's the bedroom. Okay. Where in Almeida is this bedroom? First floor, second floor? First floor. So this is laying out the it, house. Is, is this where Miss Libby stayed? No. Mm -hmm. And 412. Is that the same? Yes, same bedroom. Yes. He just, he's giving my cousin Vinny. I, with the knocking, he's just like, same. I just, ugh. It's frustrating to watch. But just because they don't do it the way I would do it doesn't mean they're wrong. It's just different, and I find it frustrating. The leading questions is wrong, in my I'll opinion. show you Mark, what's Mark 411. Don't, don't call out the answer. This is states 411 for identification at this point. Do you see the blue object in the center? Leading. Yes. Does that appear to look like the object you've described? Also leading. Yes. You're saying yes? Yes. Is it blue? It's blue. Is Still it vinyl? Yes. That appears to be the same thing you saw the defendant holding. Objection leading. Uh, Just still leading. It's early morning hours when he came in the house. Is that correct? It looks so, yes. You know, this is 6411. We'd offer at this point. No, 
Let her tell her story. She has more information than you've elicited from her. She is nervous. She cares for this family. She can care for this family and still have seen some shit. I don't know how to ask it, except to ask it. Did you ever see that blue thing unfolded when you were that morning or you saw him carrying it? It was unfolded. Okay, where did you see it? In the bedroom. That... And where in the bedroom? On the chair. And again, I'm not clear. Was that in one of these pictures we showed you? When? What chair? When? Council? When? I apologize. When? It doesn't help. Was that on one of these chairs in this? If we don't know when. Yes. Okay, and I'm referring again to 412. You saw it on the chair? Yes. Did you come? You ended up leaving at some point that day, right? Yes. When you came back the next day, was that there? No, it wasn't. It was gone? Yes, it was gone. Gone. And did you see Alex Bernal leave? After he went upstairs. Do you know what he did upstairs? No, I no. Did you actually see him leave the house after he went upstairs? Yes. Okay. And um, where did he go? Oh, I don't know. He just left outside and left. Okay. Did he say, hey, I'm leaving? Yes, he said, I'm going, yes. Okay. And at that point, what did you think? Did you think he'd gone? I thought he left, yes. Okay. Did you see him after that? Yes. Tell them where, please. He came that back. morning. He came back to the house. Okay. How do you know that? Because the blind was open. I seen him came through the driveway. And, and what did you see him? Was he walking? Was he driving? When you saw him in the driveway? He was driving the truck. And, and I'm sorry, Ms. Smith, found that. What truck was he driving? The Jerry white said truck. The white truck. And whose white truck was it? I'm thinking of Mr. Reno. I thought it was his truck. He had the white truck also. He had a white truck also. Mm -hmm. So when you saw, you testified, Mr. Murdoch coming back in a white truck, that was Mr. Randolph's truck? Mm-hmm. Whose truck was it? I don't know. Okay. Ma'am, you must use words as opposed to, mm -hmm. or because we need, need to know exactly what you're saying. Say yes or no if you can. The problem is he's leading. Whose truck did you think it was? Who cares? I thought it was Mr. Randolph's truck. And... Were there four wheelers or ATVs out on that property? Yes. Okay. What, if anything, had you observed about a four wheeler that morning? It was at the house. Okay. Where had it been previously? At the smokehouse. Okay. When did it get moved? The same day of that, um, the same morning. Okay. Same morning when Mr. Murdoch was there? Yes. Okay. And um, in Council what direction did you see Mr. Murdoch leave when you saw him leave the house and you thought he was gone? Mm -hmm. Council. You know where he went? No. And when he came back in this white truck, what did he do? He got in the other truck. Okay. How long was he gone? Probably about 10 minutes or 15 minutes. What other and truck? Then. And then you say this other truck. What truck are you talking about? It was a black truck. Had you not seen that before? No. Why not? Because the, um, the, the, um, the pool truck, the, the catering thing was still out there in the way, so I couldn't see. So that blocked your view? It blocked my view, yes. So what vehicle did Mr. Murnau leave after he came back in the white truck? What color truck? It was a black truck. Black. Do you know whose that was? No. Okay. The style of questioning is that morning, frustrating. This morning when you first saw him at 6.30, did you observe anything about his face? Any on his face? I think I got a little colored, a little blue cut or something. And it, it, man, I apologize. A little what cut? Like a, like a little bruise or something. Where was it? It's like above his forehead. Okay. I won't ask you to touch me, but can you touch yourself to show where? Right here. Something right here. Did it look fresh? This look like a cut. No, I wouldn't say fresh, but it looked. They're not giving a lot video system of of testimony in, in or allowing her house, to testify about the movements in a their, clear uh, way. Sister Murdoch, it is a very Murdoch. confusing yes. timeline. Can you tell them about that? Where was that? What was that? It was in the Miss, Miss uh, Libby's Bay Room. Okay. And how was that activated or operated? It's better, you know? No. Okay. But was it on all the time or not? Yes. Okay. 
And what color would it be if it was on? Was there a marker that are uh, red and black or red and green? Mm -hmm. Those stuff was, yes. There's a camera. There's a camera. And would there be times when that wasn't on? Yes. And do you know who controlled it? No. There's a camera in Libby's bedroom. Can we talk about the camera? That I'm actually very interested in. She does look uncomfortable and the attorney could have let her explain her warm feelings for this family and the care for this family and how she took care of them to make this a little easier. So she would have gotten to say, they're a good family, I care for this family. That doesn't hurt I'm the show state's you what's case. Mark 410. It's her perception. Do you recognize this? Allow the jury to understand how hard this is for her. Yes. Don't okay. just ask her family to stand relate up. To let what we're talking about talk. this morning as far as your location. Yes. Your Honor, 410, I believe without objection. So Does it relates. Her testimony where she was that morning. Okay. No objection. Submit it. Without objection. So, Alec came in with a blue tarp, and a whole bunch of stuff happened with different cars. It is can not you, clear can testimony. You see this on your little, you got a thing up there. And it's <laughs> hard to follow. So, I just wish they would have taken a little bit more care to let her explain. Do you mind Get down out here? of her space. This makes me so uncomfortable. Judge, can she come down here? Yes. Yes. Very briefly, he won't be long. I'm just frustrated. If you would stand up there, so just so we don't block the jurors, please. You said Mr. Griffin can see. Is this a picture of what we refer to as Almeida? Yes. Okay. And can you show where the, I guess I've called the main house? And I'm sorry we don't have a pointer. Aurelia, I agree. I agree. They That's should the have because the defense is going to come yes, in. Yes, and let her talk about how and, much and she loves the family. The prosecution down here. I know it's have. hard to see. Can you tell what that is? Sorry. Can you point to the main house again? I think the blocks and dirt. That's all we're doing. Right here. Is that where you took care of Miss Libby? Yes. Okay. So now down here is even a little woman. Do you know what this is down here? <laughs> they're giving a layout of the property. Everybody's got their back to the jury. Let me ask you this: What are the buildings on the property? The smokehouse and a, um, a barn, another okay. little shed. And where were the ATVs usually? At the smokehouse. Smoke Where's the smokehouse? Barn, that's shed. The, that's, there you go. that's the smokehouse. Mm -hmm. And that's where the ATV the was. Yes. All leading. And where did the ATV end up when you saw it after you thought Mr. Murdoch left? Had it moved? At the main house. Say that again, please. At the main house. Okay. And um, when you saw him coming back, you thought he left. Where did you see him in the white truck? Do you remember? Are they trying to argue that he took the ATV out and then came back like he, he left him across the railroad, the railroad track, you know, he left him across the railroad track okay. and went out. Which way to railroad tracks? He left on the ATV going across the railroad the tracks, the I think. So had been around, had been or he left with the... the or he That's left good. Go back, sit in down. the truck. Thank you. Just let, they should just let her talk. To be fair, this attorney has questioned every single witness like this. And this, it has gotten overcome by the law enforcement witnesses he's done this with because they testify all the time. This is a civilian witness who's probably never testified in court before, is being asked to talk about a family that she has very much affection for in a very difficult circumstance. So her testimony is not clear because the questions are not good. This is not her fault. What is going to be interesting is if the defense clears this up 
at all. But she saw what she saw and she said what she said. Just ask her the questions. It's, it's very frustrating to watch because this witness has given some really important testimony. Talked with either Mr. Griffin or Mr. Harper, you know, one of their investigators. Yes. Where was that? But her answer. Remember, I'm not looking for a date and time, but. You know how long ago? It was last year. And I met with you a couple of weeks ago? Yes. And just a little while ago this morning? Yes. And I have to ask you for the record, uh, um, this Alex Murdoch who came and saw you Leading. the night of the murders with the shorts and the shirt and the sperry type loafers on, is that him over there? Yes, sir. And is he also the person uh, I'm gonna lose my mind. that you said told you he'd been there 30 or 40 minutes? Yes. Um, and is he also the person you saw in the house that night with some kind of blue vinyl that you said consistent with this picture we put in. Mm -hmm. Is that him? Yes. Thank you. That's all. Is it weird that I'm actually looking for Cross to clear things up? Because that's not a good position to be in. I am looking for Cross to clear things up, which is very good bad. Good afternoon, Ms. Smith. Good afternoon. For the prosecution. We have met once or twice. The um... Did anyone ever show you a blue rain jacket? No. No, no, that's cool. Yes, I, yes, I think so. Yes. Now, she just some said of our no investigators yes. show you, showed you a picture of a blue rain jacket. Yeah, a right? picture of a blue rain Yes. But has anyone at SLED or the Attorney General's office ever shown you a blue rain jacket? No. Now, you saw Mr. Alec Murdoch. Bring a tarp in, you said, right? Yes. And I'm going to show you a tarp. Objection. Which we marked for identification purpose. This is your honor, exhibit 86. That's obviously not the tarp. Why aren't we objecting to is this? Is this the type of tarp that Mr. Murdoch came in to the Alameda house on the day that you were talking about? Yes. It's a very dramatic courtroom. Tarp like this that would maybe cover up a car. Is that right? Yes. Any way to confuse this with a rain jacket? No. He was not carrying a rain jacket, was he? No, it was balled up. I don't know him. And you said it was balled up. She said, I don't know. And it was balled in such a manner it did not look like there was a shovel handle, a gun, or anything. It's just balled up. Is that yes. right? Correct. Have I balled it up sort of correctly? Yes. They could All object. Right. They're yeah, not going no to. Yeah, they moved. Exhibit 86, I think. I'm in the evidence. Without objection. No objection. Now, when. Okay. Alec left that day. Okay. This was laid out on Ms. Libby's retirement sure. rocking chair, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. No, it wasn't that one. And you had. Um, Council. When you left for end of your Is shift that day, that's where it was, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you've never seen it since, correct? Correct. Now they showed you a picture, which is in evidence. <clears throat> Do you even know where that picture was taken in the house? No. In the closet. Do we, do we have that picture? Mm -hmm. She said no, then she said in the closet. Oh my God, Jim, that's put the lie. tarp away. They're just ready with the tarp. They're just, this is a tarp. I imagine it's the rain jacket that got tested for GSR then. Can you see that, Ms. Smith? Yes, no. Do you know where that is in, or even if it is in Ms. Libby's house? That's a good question. I couldn't say because I don't go in the, I don't be in the closets. So, so you don't even recognize the closet, is that right? Correct. And have you ever even been upstairs 
in Ms. Libby's house? Twice. Two times over how many years? Three years. Two times in three years. Of course she doesn't go upstairs. That's and do you know where Alec Murdoch went when he went upstairs on the day that he brought a blue tarp in the house? No. Okay. I'm very interested to see where this will go. The thing is, they're going to have law enforcement come in and talk about where they found the blue whatever it is so it's not really going to matter if she knows where the photos are or if she doesn't know where now the you photos mentioned are. that that this day that he came over was about three days after mr um, randolph murdoch's funeral is that right yes okay maybe we could get some clearer questioning on what happened next and it was Jim. early in the morning yes so and and do you remember that mr randolph's funeral being on a sunday Yes. So then it would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of that week. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That's correct. And and is that the morning that you you said that you thought you saw a bruise on his forehead? Yes. So it was Wednesday after Mr. Randolph's funeral. I'm thinking I can't I can't remember it was so long I can't remember. Yes, ma'am. And the um, and, and you mentioned that it was that he came in a truck. I think you said he, he drove up in a white truck. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. And and he does have a white truck, yes. as far as you know, right? Yes. yes. Let and then you said he left in a white truck. And are you sure that it was Mr. Randolph's truck or Mr. Alex's truck that he left oh, in? Because it was moved. Mr. Randolph had always keep his truck in a certain position, certain part. So you think he left in Mr. Randolph's truck and moved? Yes. Okay. And and when you came back, I'm excuse me, when you left that that morning, I guess Wednesday we're talking about the um, was Mr. Randolph's truck back in the driveway? Yes. Parked in its normal place. Yes. Anything out of sort? No. Was it all covered up with mud, like someone's been mudding in it? No. Um, anything unusual about the truck? No. Okay. What about the ATV? Can we clear up the? Now ATV? You mentioned there was a four wheeler that had been moved at some point Great. in time. Um, Thanks, Jim. But that four wheeler had a flat tire, didn't it? Yes, it did. Okay, was it a front tire, back tire? I think it was a back tire. And it was moved up close to the house? Yes. As far as you know, so the tire could be repaired? Yes, it was moved from the smoke house to the rental house, yes. With a flat tire? Yes, with a flat tire. A lot of flat tires. I've never, well, I've never you seen asked a truck with so flat um, tires. About the yes. the day of the city boy said mudden. Uh, Mr. Randolph's funeral. He's only a city boy when it's convenient. And you had a conversation with Alec, and he's talking to you about how long he was over at the house um, on the night of June the seventh, right? Yes. And he said he was there thirty to forty minutes. Yes. And you said no, I don't think it was that long. Yes. And then the, the next day, and I think you said, or the day after, and your or the following day, or um, I guess other than Monday, you had another conversation with him where you just brought up the fact that you were going to get married. I think you said that was a different day, right? Yes. And wait, was that a different day or the same day? And he was just being nice, wasn't he? Yes. I think you used the word good person. A good person, yes. Who were you referring to when you testified in response to the question by Mr. Meadows that someone's a good person? Mr. Alex Murdoch. Okay. Now, he, uh, Mr. Alex Murdoch's demeanor is quite different. He came over on the today. night of June the 7th uh, 
And you said it was somewhere between 8.30 and, and 9.30 in the evening? Yes. And uh, that's, that's just your best estimate of when he got there, is that yes. right? Yes. And I think you testified that he was there, in your estimation, 15 to 20 minutes? Yes. Now, when you said 15 to 20 minutes, are you talking about 15 to 20 minutes in the room with Ms. Libby or on the property the whole time? On the property the whole time. Thank you. Okay. Well, now, you said it took you about five minutes to, um, to let him in. Is that right? Yes. Good questioning. So, uh, so are you included? including the five minutes it took him to let him in in your 15 to 20, or could he have been on the property 25 minutes? 20 minutes. The only thing is no. the whole time. So. She's pretty consistent about that. And you would agree that Alec Murdoch would visit his parents frequently, right? Yes. And he would always come over more so than any other sibling is she that didn't right say that. yes and so now he's going for best and you brother? would agree that it was not out of the ordinary for Alec to come at night correct yes you She's, agree with that right no <laughs> so you don't agree that that is she said it was unusual so is it was it out of, out of the ordinary for him to come at night yes on my ship yes Better questions, get well, better answers. Do you recall answers. being interviewed, um, a telephone interview on June 17, 2021, with um, Agent Joe Albiata? Do you remember that? Yes. And do you remember telling him that it was not out, out of the ordinary for Alec to come at night? Yes, it's been a long night. I couldn't remember. It's, so, it's been a year now, so I can't re really remember. I mean, is it possible that you told him that? Yes. But as she sits here today, as she sits here today, her memory is it was unusual for her to come on and, her ship. And, and here today, you, you said, as I have in my notes, that when he came over that, that he was acting kind of fidgety, yet normal. I believe that's what you said. Mm -hmm. Is his normal behavior kind of fidgety? Yes. He's just kind of a fidgety person, right? Yes. He's so it wasn't the first guy. time you'd seen him being kind of fidgety, right? Well, he always come different times, so I can't, you know. But, but you, his demeanor was normal for Alec the night that he came over on June the seventh, wasn't it? I'll say yes. Okay. Now. That seems like a I don't know. You mentioned the okay. clothes that he was wearing, and and he came in and he sat on his mom's bed yes lay down lay, next to her lay, lay, mm -hmm. and held her hand Is he that walked, right? in, walked in and hold her hand and spoke to her then went on the bed and lay down and lay down mm -hmm. not lay down but sit up and and when he got up off off the bed was the bed soiled in any way was it wet i can't recall that i didn't touch it no okay. what did alec have alec murdoch have Blood on his clothes. No. He had blood on his shoes. No. He had blood on his hair. No. Did he leave blood on in his mom's bedroom. No. I need to go back and see what shoes he had on in that video with the first police officer on scene, because I don't think they were boat shoes. I don't remember him being in boat shoes. It now, seems like his shoes changed. According to the records that, that we've been providing in this case, you, you were interviewed um, by SLED on June 16th. Do you remember yes. that interview? Yes. And and I think in that interview, you told SLED that, that he, had, he would, had been there 30 to 35 minutes. Do you remember telling him that? I think it's, yes. Okay. And then, um, you were interviewed again uh, by telephone on June 17th. You remember so that follow-up call? So the time shift that she said at one point he was there 30 to 35 minutes and now... You remember having a short phone call on the 17th? She's 20, 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. But his cell phone mm -hmm. records show... Well, whether it's it one interview minutes. or two interviews, you never told anybody at SLED In June, in these interviews, one or two, anything about Alec coming in with a blue tarp, is that right? Right. Um, 
You didn't say anything about a blue tarp until sometime in September, is that right? Yes. And you initially mentioned something about Alec coming over with a tarp. The first time you mentioned it was to Officer Joseph Dingle of the Allendale Police Department oh, when he was working the wreck. Yet. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Okay. And, and you had been in the automobile accident, and Officer Dingle was working the wreck and, what? I guess, filling out an incident report, and you were having a conversation with him. Yes. And in that conversation with Officer Dingle... We haven't heard from Dingle yet. That's a didn't name you I tell him that, that... Didn't you tell Officer Dingle that on the night of the murders that Alec came over with a blue tarp that looked like... It had a gun in it? No, I felt like he was holding, like he was holding something. So you, you didn't say... I didn't say Pacific was a gun. I said he was holding something. Why are we eliciting this testimony as defense? I'm confused. I don't see the strategy. So you didn't tell Officer Dingle that, it, that he came over and you couldn't tell but stated it looked like a rifle? No, I said it was like he was holding something. I did not say it was a rifle. Okay. And if Officer Dingle wrote a report up saying that, he was just incorrect. Yes. Okay. That's why he elicited it. And to then after you had Dingle. this conversation with Officer Dingle. I think it's to impeach um, Dingle. Then you were contacted by sled agents, right? Mm-hmm. And they asked you to go down to um, their offices, and that's where you were interviewed uh, in September, right? Yes. And in that interview, you told him about a blue tarp mm -hmm. that you put up in your car just like this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Well, and you didn't tell them because it's not true that, that there was anything wrapped up here in here to look like a rifle. Right. Okay. Um, and since that day of the interview at the Low Country Sled Office, have you had any additional interviews with sled agents other than getting ready for trial this week, last week? Yes. How many additional interviews? Two. Two or three. Two to three and, is a lot. Jim, and in each of those interviews, did you reiterate the, the sled that it was a blue tarp and not a rain jacket that you saw Alec Murdoch walking into the house with? Yes. This is critical because what they tested for GSR. Is there any doubt in your mind it was a blue tarp like this and not a rain jacket? And it was followed up with a blue tarp. So you saw it laying on Ms. Libby's retirement yes. rocking chair, right? Yes, yes. It matters because I think what they recovered was a blue rain Second jacket nine. that had GSR in it, not a tarp. But if they don't bring in the rain jacket to show that it's similar, it'll be very interesting. So they're trying to get the point across that, I don't know, whatever the police recovered that they think a gun was wrapped in is not. So I think that's what they're trying to get at. But what's very interesting to me is the, I was here 30 to 40 minutes. How's your wedding? You know, how's your job? I know people that work at your job. That's very interesting testimony. Um, just, just one it more didn't point. come in very clearly when, though. When Alec Murdoch came over on that early morning, I guess it was Wednesday, where you, you testified. Um, were you in Ms. Libby's room? Yes. And can you, you can't see the comings and goings out of the driveway from Ms. Libby's bedroom, can you? Mm -hmm. You can? Is that a yes or no? No. Okay. Thank you, that's all the questions I have. Redirect. All right. Redirect better not feel like a cross, counsel. Let's ask some nice open questions. Testifying in front of the grand jury on January 20th of 2022 on page 25, line 17, when you were asked about how long do you think he stayed in total. Do you remember that? Yes. Do you remember your answer being 20, 10, 15, 20 minutes? Yes. It's grand jury testimony that he's going to. Mr. Griffin asked you about the 30 to 40 minutes 
<laughs> Why'd you call your brother after that? Because he's a, he's a chief, assistant chief police at Ronville. So I called him. Had that statement by Alex Murdoch affected you? Yes. How? Good I question. Nervous. I was nervous. Good question. Why? Why? Ask her why. And he, Mr. Griffin, asked no. you about the evening why? visits and the morning visits. Had he ever been there at 6.30 in the morning like he was that morning? Ever? No. And his 9, 9.30 visit the night of the murders, that was very unusual for him to be at night, wasn't it? Objection leading. Don't leave the room. I'm sorry. It is leading. Counsel, ask her why she was yes. nervous. Was that unusual? Yes. Keep objecting, Jim. He, he's not asking good questions. Now, so so you, you told an officer, did you tell an officer about this? You saw something that he thought he was carrying? Yes. Before you told anybody else? Yes. And, and what was that about, a traffic accident? I had a, someone hit my car, and he was on, on duty. And when was that? September 11th. That's my birthday. Okay. You had an accident. Great. And you told the officer that you had seen him Alex Murdoch come and hold him something? He was talking, he was having a conversation, and that came up. And you just told him that? Mm -hmm. He was talking. Mm -hmm. Had anybody asked you that before? Mm -hmm. Did you have to say yes or no? Yes. Before? Had anybody no. asked no. you that before? No. Okay. So why did you tell the officer that on September 11th? Because he was, he was having a conversation and just talking in general, and he asked me a question, and I said, yes, I've been there, and I said, I work with the Murdochs. They keep, you know, they home. This is right after the roadside incident. This In response to him, southern. you told him you saw Alex Murdoch with what? They were having a, a chat. A, a lining, a blue tart. They were and having you a chat. Tart or tart? Tart. Like you cover a car with a tart. And you said you saw him with that, and did it appear he was carrying something? Like he was holding something. It was, it was bundled up. I can't think it was bundled up. Bundled up? Yes. Like this? Yes. Put it down! So you never saw this unfolded? No, I never saw it. Never. So the next morning, so it was on the chair, I'm just looking through The next You don't know where morning. this talk came from, do you? No, I don't know where it came from. This is right after the roadside incident. didn't have silver on one side, did it? No. It was all blue? All blue. And you said that the defense took a statement from you? Yes. They, did they report it? Yes. Y'all know under Rule 613, I'd like a copy of that statement or the recording at this oh, time. Oh, did they never did provide they it? She's now taking the stand. They never provided it? <laughs> Your Honor, under Rule 5, it is not subject to being produced. She's testified. And we didn't question her about the statement, so. Yes, you did. Rule 5 is pretrial. Your Honor, 613, once the witness is taking the stand and she says oh. that they took the statement from her, either reported or written, we don't have it, hadn't been provided. He asked her about that specifically, dealing with the uh, blue tarp and when they discussed it with him. I'd like a copy of it. I actually don't mind him having it, Your Honor. We don't have a copy with us. Oh, boy. It says upon request, the same shall be shown or disclosed to opposing counsel. They're doing this in front of the jury. Rule 611A. So <laughs> the defense must provide it to counsel. Oh, boy. They're just. Don't turn your back to the jury. This is a moment. Your Honor, we, we do have a copy here. I don't know if we can download it to. Yeah. They're just going to put it on a thumb drive. Look at the flash drive. But Ask for a break for lunch. Yeah. Ask to break for lunch. Ask to break for lunch to review it. Your Honor, we'd like to take a break for lunch to review it before further questioning this witness. Recording. Take a break. Break, 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 I'm break. To listen break, to that break, presence here. I'm assuming it'll be a hard copy, but I don't want to mess the court schedule up either. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have you go to the jury room. Please not discuss the no, case. No, no. It's lunchtime. Excuse me. Excuse me. Can we have a break for lunch so they can review it? Excuse. A lunch break. Perhaps a lunch break. And if you take a lunch break, then they can review it over lunch and then they can continue questioning this witness. Good move by the prosecution. I mean, they can't find a direct question with two hands and a map, but... That was a solid move in front of the jury. This witness has had some very good testimony. Wait, can we get sound? Tell me got a written transcript. They don't care about your written transcript, Dick. 
They want the audio. They have the right to listen to it. Send everyone to lunch. Oh, this is fascinating. We're at ease momentarily. We're at ease. We're at, e we're at ease momentarily. What is happening today? Woo! All right. We're going to see if we can parse what the fuck just happened while we wait for lunch. I hated everything about that direct examination, but the information that came in was quite good. Oh, look how the chair is framed. We haven't gotten this angle on the chair. Look at that. I'm fascinated. Look at that. It's got the it's got the seal right above the chair. This courtroom is stunning. All right, we're going to answer some questions. Look, there's like 37,000 of you in here. If you haven't subscribed yet, uh, please do. We have subscribers only mode on for the chat. Why? Because we get hit with those bots that want you to go hit the link and download nefarious things that'll probably infect your computer with viruses. Um, so we keep it on subscribers mode because especially when we get when we get to this point, we tend to get inundated with those things. So the court is at ease. This witness, this witness is the caregiver for Alec Murdaugh's mother. She saw Alec come over the night of the murder. He was fidgety, but it wasn't unusual. Climbed into bed with his mom. Um, the chat has suggested he was seeking comfort from his mother after what had happened. That is not an unreasonable expectation, but he climbed into bed with his mother, was there for about 20 minutes, was on his phone a little bit, and then left. Came back after his father's funeral, and there was a lot that was going on with um, trucks and moving trucks and bringing in a tarp. They did not make that very clear. He drove up. There was an ATV. He drove off. He's in one car. He's in the other car. He took off across the train tracks and came back. The prosecution, I think, will argue this is when he brought guns over and then ditched the guns. But then there's this whole tarp raincoat soliloquy. Was it a tarp? Was it a raincoat? And who did she tell? And she never brought it up because she wasn't asked until she got hit in her car shortly after the roadside incident. The timing on that seems a bit sus. The judge is walking back into the courtroom, but maybe that's just because I'm on high alert at this point. <laughs> but she and the officer on the side of the road had a chit chat. And it sounds like that was, they were like, did you hear about Alec Murdoch? Because that's right after he got shot in the head on the side of the road. Well, let's I'm not say, surprised um, they were having a southern chat. You need chat. A half an hour to listen to this tape. We, we can take lunch. We have a rough draft of a transcript that we're emailing to them, for, but it's 57 pages long. But we're sending it to them. They want the audio. They don't want the transcript. Audio. The transcript doesn't help. The transcript doesn't help. A, a rough draft. So I'd like to look at the video at this point. Yes, 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 I'm yes. Gonna bring the jury in, in and break for lunch. Yes. Y'all should have listened to me. I said that 10 minutes ago. It wasn't that long ago. I am courtroom management. They have to provide the video. So the defense interviewed this witness on video. They are asking to provide the video. They are going to get to watch it over lunch. The judge is going to break this jury for lunch. They weren't ever going to use it. That's why they have a rough draft, because they weren't ever going to use this or introduce it. But they do have to turn it over in discovery. This witness has now testified. So there's a lot that's going to happen. Um, over the lunch break, we're going to get to some questions before I break for lunch as well. Um, I'm going to try to get to some questions relating to this and then we'll back up a little bit. The rain jacket could have been inside the blue tarp. It's possible, or it could have been mistaken. I mean, I had a witness once describe the defendant who was wearing all black as a ninja. And there was, there was no, that is what they remembered. This, this witness remembers a tarp, what they find in the closet. The defense is going to argue it could have been there forever. And the prosecution's going to argue this is what he brought in. And the jury is going to get to decide whether it is how relevant it is and what weight to give it and whether they think it's whether they think it is or is not the same thing that this witness saw come in. But here's what I'm saying. Her getting hit in a car might be completely unrelated. The timing is it's just everything about this case is weird to me. So I am literally just like on my spidey sense is just all over the place with this case. 
She gets hit in her car. The policeman who shows up is talking about the Murdoch's because of course they are because it's the biggest bit of gossip that's happened in this town is that, oh my God, did you hear he got shot on the side of the road? And she, I'm not surprised, was like, actually, I work for the Murdoch's. I was there the night that the family was murdered and then they were having a chitty chitty chat chat. It's literally the most Southern thing I've ever thought of uh, or heard of that they're right, actually thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, having we'll, a chat. Uh, break for lunch till 2.30, till 2.30. And um, this is joy number. There's a question. Uh, Sarah Ham in the chat pointed out a very interesting point. Two of the other uh, passengers in the boat crash were also seven twenty nine. I'll speak with you during lunch. And oh, so you can return to the jury room, please. There's a juror he wait, 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 what? There's a juror he needs to speak to during lunch. Do they feed the jurors? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Um, the court's not off the bench yet because they're gonna talk to the lawyers. Lunch is till 2 30, which means I will be back here at 1 25 p.m. Central Standard Time. So about an hour and 10 minutes. I'm not gonna leave yet, but it looks like one of the jurors is going to be spoken to over lunch. I'm curious as to what that's about. A lot of accidents going on, so I'm not surprised. We're going to take a break for lunch. Um, you just cannot discuss your testimony with anyone during lunch, but you can step down and, and have a good lunch. Be at ease. And we you... will be in recess until 2.30. All right. The court is now officially in recess till 2.30. I am very curious as to what this juror wants to say. I am not excited about that at all. It could be that somebody, it's Monday. It could be anything. It could be that the juror has a family emergency that's come up. It could be that people have discussed their had discussed the case. It could be that something happened over the weekend. It when you've got a juror that needs to talk to the court after a weekend break, it worries me about what has happened. So we will see. Um, I think this witness was reluctant because of her affection for the family, and she knows I think she can see the way the testimony is going, but also there's a reason that this witness chose to call her brother, who is a chief of police, and have a conversation with her. I wish that they had asked why. When they said this, um, this, this witness was uncomfortable, I really, really wish they had asked, why are you uncomfortable? So for the youtube -y things, go ahead and, um, you know, do the, do the subscription things. Go ahead and like the video, those types of things. We're going to answer some questions and then take a break for lunch with the over 37,000 of you that are still here in the chat. So thank you. I'm very interested to hear. So what else this witness has to say after the lunch break? Because this witness has a lot of information. Um, a lot of information. And she thought it was sus. And I want to know why. All right, let's get to some questions. We're going to take a quick swoop. We'll... I've done a lot of summaries. This one's gonna be very brief. This morning, we have had the caregiver for Alec Murdaugh's mom, Miss Libby, testifying. She was there the night of the murders when Alec arrived at the house. They had conversations after the murder and it's been very interesting information that has come in. We also have the judge ruling that the motive evidence, the character evidence, the 404 evidence that we've been hearing outside the presence of the jury will come in and the prosecution said that we will not get there today, but in the coming days, we will start to hear that evidence again in front of the jury this time. It's like one more time with jury. It's been a very interesting morning. It it seems like the prosecution still doesn't know what a you know non-leading question is. The defense has objected maybe twice. They're gonna be fighting over a blue type versus a blue raincoat for the rest of the afternoon. And the prosecution made a demand of discovery right at the end of the uh, witness. And now that that witness has testified and the defense has asked about the conversation that the witness had with the defense, that, that evidence or that, it's not evidence, that interview gets turned over to the prosecution so they can see what this witness said to defense and defense investigators. Wow, it's a day. Oh, wait, we're going to get to questions. It's time to get to questions. For those of you that are new here, uh, we call that FAQ or FAQ around.
as I always say, better questions get better answers. And the prosecution was not doing that, um, not doing that easily today. I found it difficult. This witness might have been reluctant to answer. She was definitely by no means a hostile witness. And hostile doesn't mean hostile like, Ugh. it doesn't mean like emotionally hostile. Hostile means that the witness can be treated as an opposing witness so you can cross-examine them. This witness was not refusing to answer. I think she was answering to the best of her ability given the questions that were asked. And instead of breathing for a beat, this prosecutor would ask a question and then immediately ask another question. She was clearly upset by having to testify, stressed, nervous, and who wouldn't be. This is a family she's worked for and likes. Of course she's going to be nervous. They could have aired it out. The court's got nothing but time, but this prosecutor made it feel like I was running late to something that I was about to get in trouble for. And that is not how you want your witness to feel. Just, I wish they would have taken a breath and let this witness tell her story. It doesn't matter that she likes the family. In fact, I think it makes her more credible that she likes the family. It makes her more credible. She thinks Alec Murdoch is a good person. Fine. The jury gets to decide. The jury gets to decide how she feels. The jury gets to decide that. Just let her talk. I'm frustrated by that. But I understand. The jury's going to understand why she's nervous. Just so let her tell her story. All right. Let's go. Um, EDB is well rested and back to her normal feisty self. I'm a little feisty. I was definitely tired or more tired last week. I'm sure I'll be exhausted by the end of today, but ugh. I was getting Mac Lock was a documentary vibes. I mean, today has been wild. Can we just have you inject and have you redirect via video? Call? No, it's not my job to tell them how to do their job, but it's frustrating. How long does it take you to cook grits? I mean, that's the vibe I was getting by this prosecutor. And sometimes I don't know how many trials the AGs do. I know that Creighton Waters is a very experienced attorney. I just don't know how many trials they've done. I don't know if this is just a different style that is much more common in South Carolina. I've never practiced in South Carolina. I've never lived in South Carolina. I've been there once. So it is not for me to say that this is outside of their typical uh procedure and protocol and the fact that none of the attorneys are objecting kind of leads me to believe that maybe it is, but there is, there are some universals when dealing with witnesses. And I think this witness could have been dealt with better because I very much wanted to hear what she had to say. This was really important testimony. Will it get lost because of the style of questioning? I just don't know. We need, is anyone going to object merch? I mean, I need to like, I just need an objection button that's just like objection, objection, objection. And that's for the defense and the prosecution. The defense is as frustrating as the prosecution. Everyone's frustrating in this. Everyone, everyone. There were days that Brooks was more clear where he was arguing than any of these attorneys have been. And that's wild to me. Um, she did say it was a good family at the beginning. She did, but they, my criticism of the attorneys is they did not, they asked her to explain where she went to school from elementary school, which they've asked a lot of witnesses and confuses the hell out of me. But what they didn't ask is for her to explain working for this family. They didn't allow her to explain things that were relevant to this. They were like, and where do you go to church? And you bring food to church? Great. Let her explain working with this family more. Why can't we see the evidence, pictures, videos? We can. They just get posted later. They do not get displayed during trial. Um, Tamara said, huge reasonable doubt was a 30 to 40 minutes an instruction to lie or just stressed out, bereaved person misremembering things. I can't believe it happened in just that 30, 40 minutes I was here. What this witness said is whatever Alec Murdoch said to her made her call her family member who was in law enforcement. So it made her nervous. They didn't get into why, which I'm disappointed by. But with most of the evidence in this case, Tamara, it's a fair point. Most of the evidence in this case can be interpreted two ways. Almost everything I talk about in this case, it's like, could be this, could be that, could be this, could be that. And that's hard for the prosecution. So far, there's not a lot of evidence that's like, it's this. Most of it is, how do you interpret it? You could interpret it either way. Um, Susie Q 
says, I was a civil litigation paralegal for 20 years. So much big D energy happens. I love the Beach family attorney. He faces so much low country animos low country animosity, attorney animosity. I'm also dyslexic and have ADHD. Love your coverage. He definitely has faced it a bit of animosity. And um, and he you heard him say in the 404 hearing that people were shocked that he was trying to hold Alec Murdoch personally accountable for the boat crash. Is this like mansplaining, but with an attorney law splaining? I don't know what part of the trial that came in at. Probably. I work for a guy with a big ranch. We never know what vehicle he is driving. That's very fair. There's a lot of vehicles going on here. Um, and that doesn't seem odd given everything we've heard that everybody's driving all different vehicles. Emily, how should the prosecutor deal with a witness that seems reluctant to answer questions fully with kindness, only giving partial or incomplete answers with follow-up, which requires listening and fierce attention. So if she didn't quite explain, you can say, I heard you say this, but did what else happened or was there something next? You just follow up on the questions until you hear full answers. It's It just requires follow-up and you slow down. You slow down. Um, Ali M96, I'm getting so confused. Same. All day. All day. All day. Can the leading questions of the prosecuting attorney be used in appeals? No, because the defense isn't objecting to them. It's annoying. And every time the defense objects, it's sustained. The court sustains it every single time and says, don't lead the witness. And then they drop right back into it, which is, which is, <sighs> Frustrating. KO said they told him he crossed the line in the sand trying AM personally. They did tell him that. And it'll be interesting to hear that in front of the jury. Very interesting. Question, was the person privy to that conversation that Waters brought up revealed? Yes, that happened earlier this morning. It's like both sides aren't listening. Instead, they want a specific narrative. Yes, which is not helpful to either of their cases. Emily, could the follow-up question be tell me more? It could be or explain more about that. It absolutely could be. I mean, if you're not sure what to ask, sometimes it's, what did you see after that? What did you hear after that? What did you do after that? What did you notice next? It's not saying, and did you see this tarp wadded up, carrying like he was holding something? That's a cross-examination. <laughs> Question, I know the jury isn't allowed to make notes during the trial, but can they write down as much as they can remember while it's fresh in their mind? No. There's nowhere for them to write it down. They have to sit and listen. Maybe this, maybe the jury's going to ask the judge, why can't we take notes? This is killing me. I don't understand anything that's happening. That would be great. The jury's like, your honor, I literally can't WTF. That would be fantastic. Um, I'm about to be okay with what if anything being said. I am too. What if anything did you see next? I wouldn't even be mad at because at least it wouldn't be leading. Who decides who does the direct and cross in a case? The lawyers themselves. Whoever chose this lawyer to direct this, um, direct the, I don't know what, what that is, made a bad choice. I'm not sure which witness we are referring to, but this lawyer with that witness didn't feel like a right match. To be fair, she is nervous, and when given the chance, she still gives short answers. She does give short answers, and they could have fleshed that out. I could be more patient, but after weeks of them just leading witnesses. It's very frustrating to watch. Um, it seems like attorneys from both sides are making critical mistakes. It's odd, but also when the prosecution's leading like that, it, I think it shows to the jury that they're not confident in their case. I just, it's not a good look. Um, my mom's a hospice RN. It takes very special people, very special people. It's clear that this woman has a huge heart and a ton of patience. Um, I feel so bad for her. Yes. Same. She looked very, she looked gutted by having to be there, though she knew she was going to have to be there. Um, so I wish Camille was there. Um, are you finding the attorneys to be surprisingly low quality? It's a very different style and it's very odd to me. It's just, I have not watched enough trials in this jurisdiction to know if this is, it's just, you know how people have regional vernaculars? I, I just, I don't know. Nobody seems to be objecting like this is unusual. So it might just be me. Um, wonder if he's used his regular phone or burner phone to call her. Don't know. We would have to look and see if they even identified the number to the mom's house because 
I don't know if that's on the call records. I would sure want to, I would sure want to, I would want to have asked her, do you know the number at the house? What is the phone number at the house? So that when the jury looks through the call records, they know which call is him calling the house to be let in, or they don't see it on the call records and then are left with some questions. But we don't know the number to Libby, Miss Libby's house because nobody's asked that question. This is real difficult for her, and I wish these lawyers would be gentle. I'm uncomfortable already. The cross was actually much more gentle. I think this was a good witness for defense and the prosecution. The judge is so unbothered with AM's Brooks stare. In fact, I doubt any sort of outburst would shake him. The man is as solid as an enduring oak. The judge seems pretty unflappable. I don't understand why isn't the defense objecting to leading. I don't know. I don't know. But at some point, they should keep objecting until the court takes a moment and and scolds the prosecution. They should object every single question. And yes, you run the risk of pissing off the judge, but the judge is already annoyed. So who cares at this point? It's leading, it's leading, it's leading. The problem is these lawyers forget that the jury don't know what they know. I think that's true. I think they're way too close. Um, I think they're way too close to the case and they are not telling the story. They don't know how to tell the story, not at all. Makes my prosecutor heart sad, same, same. And I also wonder how Creighton's been so successful in paper cases because paper cases need so much story because they're mostly paper. Um, she looks genuinely terrified. Yes, she did. And I don't think the jury will forget what she said. She had some very big moments in her testimony. Um, there was testimony, don't let Murdoch do favors for you and be careful of favors you do for them. There was, there was. Honesty, that was from one of the law enforcement officers, I believe, or much earlier in this case. Um, so that is a very interesting point because it sounded like he was trying to do favors for her. And when you start putting those things together and they need to put it together well in closing, but I don't think they can wait and count on closing to tie it together. I think they need to answer these questions for the jury as it goes along. Um, truly, I'm behind... Just after lawyer friend testified, I still don't see motive. Why kill MM and PM because of money problems? We did talk about that a bit earlier. It's the South, Emily. Un objecting would be unseemly. Maybe it is just out of politeness. But these attorneys don't seem to be too worried about politeness. We've heard um, and we've seen them get into each other's space. We've seen these courtroom tactics play out. Have any of the witnesses, other witnesses treated like this? This prosecutor... Every witness he has done direct on, he is treated like this witness. He's asked about your mom and them and who has kids. And at first I was like, are you only going to ask the female witnesses if they had kids? He asked the male witnesses that too. He has asked the same questions of every witness he has done. Um, so anyone with dementia doesn't know which end is up after 6 p.m. I, I think it's a good question. One of the officers commented on that again that's that's what one of the officers commented on and then this witness seemed to um, support that his mom wouldn't have known he was there or not i have family in south carolina specifically in that part of south carolina the folks are very cordial and friendly and want to know who your people are and that might be a big part of it too like the where you went to high school it might just be regionally um common and appropriate it's so strange to me coming from los angeles it's just I think if I asked a witness if they had kids, they would be like, ew, <laughs> why are you asking me this? Um, why doesn't Alec have a key to his mother's house? My kids have keys. Weird that they need to let him in. I don't know. They didn't ask that. But they did ask if he comes and visits more than his siblings, which was interesting. He's there the most, right? Okay. Ding, ding for Alec the golden child, I guess. Um, how... Did they add a brand new tarp into evidence? No one objected. No one objected. It's not evidence, but now it is because no one objected. They could have. They didn't. I don't know what's happening. I think the lawyers have their list of questions and really don't listen to what anybody is saying, which is not the way to do a criminal trial. It works in a civil trial because you've had depositions on depositions and things don't really change. It does not work in a criminal trial. Things tend to be a bit more fluid. Matt Bond, does he do this to the witness to make the witness comfortable? I think that's part of it. It's just, again, it's it's strange. Did the police also collect Murdoch's clothes, light blue shirt and slacks worn earlier in the Snapchat? 
We have not heard anything about the close from the Snapchat at all. The judge should voice audiobooks if he retires. I agree. Um, why did they elect to do so many trials? Are they required to separate civil and blue collar? It seems like it would be more cost effective to just have one big trial. Misty, the murder cases definitely need to be a separate trial than the financial crimes. They can't all be one. I think it's appropriate that they broke them up. Some of the murder cases or some of the financial crimes might go together, but I think there would have been more fighting over keeping this separate, and I think it's appropriate. Some of that stuff will come in, but doing months and months of trial for really discreetly separate crimes would be tedious for a jury and things would get lost. Um, I think it, I don't think trying them all together would, would be helpful if the financial crimes convince the jury of motive for murder, how would going too deep cause turnover on appeal since no legal malpractice occurred? Um, well, the legal malpractice isn't the issue. It's at what point does 404 become overly prejudicial and the jury does not have enough independent facts to find the homicide and is using the bad acts to find the homicide. This case can run the risk of becoming a trial within a trial on Alec Murdoch stealing from clients. And they've got to be careful with that. So just to clarify, if the crimes were not related to the murder, then this would fall under character. However, the prosecution is arguing this evidence goes to motive, not character due to relevance. They're arguing, they're kind of, it depends. They're arguing that this is motive and context. So the prior bad acts go to motive, but it's also going to context. So it's both. It's both 403 and 404 evidence. Uh, what does limiting instruction mean? It means that the jury is told what they can consider certain evidence for. It limits the scope of that evidence. Sorry, I feel like I'm talking a million miles a minute. I'm going to see if we've got um, some other questions we can get to. Will this judge hear the financial crimes trials? Not all the financial crimes trials are in this county. So no, this judge will not hear all the financial crimes trials. Um, why didn't Rogan Gibson try to reach Alec when he couldn't reach Paul? He tried Maggie, but not Alec. That's true. Don't know. Probably, I don't know. He didn't. Um, I just answered that. Question, if he's found guilty, do you think when Poots and Beans appeal on this 403-404, they'll say Newman was biased based on his son dying before trial? I don't think so. Gross argument, but I don't put it past them. I don't think so. The judge made it very clear that even though his son passed shortly before this trial, he could still be fair. He's clearly a jurist that's been on the bench quite a long time and can answer those questions uh, or can, um, can separate those things. Can any of the testimony about the financial crimes in this trial hurt the actual financial trial? I don't think so unless testimony is not truthful and then it'll come up at the financial crimes trial. Um, there's just more transcripts out there. If he's convicted of this, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the financial crimes cases and whether they're all lumped together and settled. Love said, is uh, the DP a possibility? The state has sought not, the state has stated they will not seek that. Um, so is it possible? Yes, it's possible in this state. No, the state is not seeking it in this case. Um, how will this help the murder trial if this won't be allowed before the jury? SG Blues, that was the hearing to see if it would be allowed before the jury, and it is going to be allowed before the jury. Um, didn't he have sneakers on in the video, not boat shoes? It seems to... I need to go back and look at the video from the body cam footage, if we have video of the body cam footage. From the stills, I thought he had sneakers on when he got back to his house with police, not boat shoes. I thought he was wearing sneakers, which is why I think we saw the prosecutor asking, you know, sneakers, not sneakers, just being sure. But let's go, let's go look at that real quick. Um, because I know where those stills are. We're going to just go grab them real quick. Um, is anyone else having, if the blue tarp doesn't fit vibes, kind of, they're very, very excited about the blue tarp. Um, let me get back to sharing my screen with y'all and see if we can pull that up. Um, let me, I don't know if they're going to have a photo of the blue tarp. I still want to know what was on Alec Murdoch's seatbelt. We still haven't heard what the DNA came back. We know that there's biological material on one of the shotguns. We still haven't heard that. There's a lot of testimony yet to come, but I want to see the stills from the body cam 
And so that's what I'm looking for. The stills from the body cam from the night. Ah, that looks like he's in flip flops to me. But these are on Court TV's uh, website. If you just touch, it says exhibits, not exhibities. But if you just hit exhibits, um, that's a very dark photo, though. The night of this is a still from body cam footage from that night. And then we have body cam of him in the we have body cam of him in the um, police vehicle. But I don't remember what he was wearing. And I need to go back and see if I need to go back and see what the testimony is of the, um, of the officers. The jury will have these videos. A lot of those we don't have in evidence. Let me see if there's any other stills that are in evidence real quick. I'm just going to scroll along the bottom here and see if there are any more stills from that body cam. Um, because she very clearly said he was wearing shorts, a t-shirt, and cloth shoes. They didn't ask her what color the t-shirt was, which was interesting to me. But maybe from pre-interviews, they know that she doesn't remember, and so why elicit it? But if she didn't remember, then maybe the defense would have asked it. Uh, but I don't know. So these are, I don't think we have any other stills of Alec that night. So I will have to go look. He is definitely not wearing it in the video with the tree in the video with the tree. He's wearing like a leather work shoe, um, long pants and like a blue button down work, uh, office shirt. So that I can't tell what he's wearing on his feet. And I think that's it. That's very clearly the white shirt that the officer said she thought was odd because the shirt wasn't, um, the shirt wasn't, wet and he was sweating a lot. So anyway, these are on courttv.com. There are quite a lot of them and you can kind of scroll through all the exhibits uh, that they have posted. I will look for other stuff at the end. Um, they, I thought he had on khaki shorts. They have described these shorts as khaki. These seem like a dark olive green. And the officer said that they were khaki. Um, I don't think they were describing the color. I think they were describing the style of short or the, the um, material of short, but they are they were described by multiple people as dark olive. It was confusing to me until I saw the pictures as well. I was like, wait, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? Amy said, guy on the stand, hired as my next attorney. He's an old Southern bulldog, unflappable. He definitely had some sass. Uh, there was sass to be had. Derek said, who do I sue for spitting my coffee on my keyboard after there's a lot of pages? You may be confused. Um, I think the defense, I think the defense <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing, um, other streamers say this guy should be disbarred. I don't know what other streamers and I don't know which guy apologies against the tide. I don't know which guy they're talking about. So I don't know if they're talking about Tinsley, if they're talking about the other attorneys, but I imagine if Tinsley is testifying in this case, the beach family has waived privilege to allow him to testify in this case. Rob looked up the transfer of the properties to Maggie's name, and after reviewing, they had many liens against them. I don't know how that would have benefited from Maggie's death. Well, Maggie would have discovered that, too, as they were doing all the property stuff in the beach case, because as they were doing all the property stuff in the beach case, all of that would have come out. Um, question, how did Alec act after the boat accident? Do you mean immediately after the crash or following the legal battle? Immediately after the crash, when he was trying to obstruct the investigation, um, which is also subject to, to criminal indictments now, but there are, he's been accused of obstructing that. And we have heard from many that he was involved in obstructing and trying to make sure that Paul was not prosecuted for the boat case. So there is quite a lot of context here. With that, I just want to make sure that our you can find the stream for this afternoon um, because that is going to be where we go next. I'm going to take a break for lunch. Y'all can take a break for lunch and trust that I will be back this afternoon for lots more of the prosecution's case. Today, we have started getting into really the heart of this case. I'm going to make sure that we've got uh, subscribers mode on over there. So if you want to go chat 
over in that stream. You can take the conversation over there as I wrap up this stream to go get some nuggies for lunch. You know what else I have for lunch, y'all? I got them. They arrived. I have some all dress chips. So I am definitely, look, I can't even talk about the all dress chips without just being like, oh my God, it's time to go eat. So I'm going to go get some nuggies. I'm going to get some all dress chips. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being Lonards. I hope we see all like almost 40,000 of you that were here today back for this afternoon. If I didn't get to your super chat, I appreciate the support and I will talk to you soon. Okay. With that, Lonards, you know where to find me. I'll see you after lunch. Let's go. You can find all the Lawnerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. Connect with me on social media at the Emily D Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts, The Emily Show and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the quick bits.